is Weekly Scrap, number 202. My guest tonight is Mike Lombardo. He is a 45-year veteran of the fire service, commissioner of the chief of department of the Buffalo Fire Department from January 2006 to January 2010. Mike was a member of the development team for the New York State Firefighter Survival and Rapid Intervention Programs. He's a two-time Firehouse Magazine Heroism Award recipient, 1988-1994. The recipient of the FDIC 1999 Tom Brennan Training Achievement Award. He has the degrees. He's got the qualifications. If you want a subject matter expert in firefighting, just look no further. He's contributed to the National Firefighter, Fallen Firefighters documentary, Giving Courage, Line of Duty Death, Chiefs Speak. He's been involved in investigations, articles, you name it. Um, he's a member of the board of directors. This is, this is the, the most impressive. I mean, member of the board of directors of the Fire Department Training Network. Like the, there's nothing else needs to be said where he presents and developed the fire command program currently operates with the Christiana fire department in Delaware and the East Amherst fire department in New York chief Mike Lombardo. It is absolutely my honor to have you on as the guest of weekly scrap number 202. Welcome my brother. Well, thank you very much. I'm humbled. Happy to be here. Thank you very, very much for having me. This is a very big deal for us this evening because it's the first time ever that we've gone live and streamed to multiple platforms all across, and we're going to have multiple people logging in um, to send questions, comments, and everything as we go through it. So we're very, very, very excited about it. So with all that being said, is there anything I missed in the intro or anything you would like to add that I left out? Um, dad, two kids, both older now, 40 and 48. Love it. And, uh, happily married for 43 years. Brother, that is an accomplishment that is all on its own merits, man. Uh, okay. If you would, uh, audience, please get your questions ready for Chief Lombardo or myself. Get them primed, get them ready. It's going to be a good scrap. Quick announcements. If you are not a member of the Vigilantes, go and become a member of the Vigilantes, firehousevigilance.com. It is the cool kids club. Man, there's so much going on there, and I won't even go into it right now um, because I want to say this right out the gate before I say anything. Birmingham Fire and Rescue. Uh, it, it's pretty recent. It just it just recently, Jordan Melton, he has succumbed to his injuries. That's the firefighters that were, they walked into the fire station and they shot those firefighters. And Jordan Melton has succumbed to his injuries. The other fire fighter jamal jones he is fighting and we will keep him in our prayers magic city truck academy oj Koloje and clay mcgee they are working hard there's a giant raffle going on for the families so go and visit them and be a part there is no justification for this there's nothing i can even say that even makes sense to make it make sense um does anything make was there something it just was a random, crazy, let's go to the firehouse and shoot somebody. So far, that is what it appears to be. I don't know if anything else has come out of it. I don't want to speak that, that anything I don't know. But for now, it appears well, to be a random. How horrible. A targeted at first responders, but random. And so, like, the worst of every world. So, uh, but yeah, hit up Magic City Truck Academy. Hit up Clay McGee. Hit up OJ Koloje. And be a part of that raffle for the families. So, I wanted to get that out of the way at the beginning. So out the gate, let's get the sponsors done. Key Hose, the hose experts. Check them online at keyhose.com and follow them on Facebook. Affordable Drill Towers, home of the Affordable Drill Tower and the Affordable Standpipe Prop. It is firefighter owned and operated. Pump and roll using the Affordable Standpipe Prop. The Affordable Standpipe Prop fits through most classroom doorways for standpipe theory, and then you can roll it into the parking lot and pump it. It comes with six standpipe valves that can be upgraded to PRVs or something custom to your jurisdiction. Call Steve, 844-55-TOWER, or drop an email to info at affordabledrilltowers.com. Port City Fire Training. Anthony Rowett, man, one of my favorite people, one of my favorite brothers. Check him out and what he offers. Go to portcityfiretraining.com. And then finally, firestationfurniture.com. Provides a complete line of quality furniture for your firehouse. Firefighter owned and operated. They understand the strain firefighters put on furniture and offer furniture that's built to last. 
Visit firestationfurniture.com for more information. So there we go. Bills are paid. Announcements are made. We got Chief Mike Lombardo ready to field your questions. Chief, I'm going to read you a few comments coming at you. It says, let's go. Joe Gavita says, new home, same scrap. It's hard to scrap 200. Chief Lombardo can do it. This is going to be awesome. Congrats. Hit the thumbs up. There we go. Looking good. Sounding good. Let's go. Chief, three Bugled Firefighter checking in and taking notes from Indianapolis. Lots of comments. Chief Scott Thompson said, looking forward to this. Thank you, Chief, for being here. And Jeff Stone said, Chief has the comfy chair ready to rock. So there you go, Chief. Are you ready? I sure am. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Everybody knows if you're on the scrap, I always send out an email that says, hey, what topics would you like to talk about? What do you want to discuss? And I love doing that. And then, of course, the audience drives everything. But um, one of the big things that Chief uh, Lombardo sent back to me was he came up through the ranks and he has a lot of different perspectives to share. So I wanted to start there and just kind of throw it to you. It's kind of a soft toss that you can take any direction you want, but uh, all the uh, coming up through the ranks and all the perspectives hit me. So what I'm talking about a little bit is I do a class. Um, I did it all over last year, all over New York state, but I do it other places too. Five points of command right away. People think, Oh, it's a chief course. And it's really not. And it's my little way. When I became a, a acting battalion chief, I wanted something to keep my head straight to make sure I was hitting all the important points. And I came up with those five points, tack in the fire, back up the attack, cover the exposures, vent and search. Those five things are done. I feel pretty good about how the fire is going to go. And those aren't in order there. If it was magic, it would be at once. Usually it can't be staffing wise, but right. if magically I'd rather be at once. But um, those five things though, we have to look at, there's other important stuff on the fire ground, right? Right. Forcible entry, laddering, but they aren't the objective. I don't ladder a building to ladder it. I ladder a building to get inside, to have a way to get outside. I force entry for much the same thing. Right. It's not a the end all the be all, but attacking the fire is right. And the perspective I'm talking about, at least in this context, is that it is for every rank. Like I'm the firefighter. How does attack affect me? How am I able to move that hose line in and get it to the seat of fire to put the fire out? As a company officer, how am I finding that fire, getting my crew in, selecting the right line? and getting in there and getting that job done. And then as a chief, do I have all these things being hit? Is a good primary search taking place? Are we getting the ventilation we need? Um, do we have lines in place, not only to attack the fire, but to cover the exposures to back up the initial line? So all those people, right? All those members are looking at that, the same objectives, but they have a little bit different slant depending on the position they're in. I'm the nozzle. I know what I'm doing. I'm right. the backup. I used to always call him the roving linebacker. It's the shittiest job on the fire ground that might be one of the most important. Right. And I really do believe at times, so as goes the backup, so goes the fire. Because the good, the bad backup is the guy that's two feet away from the nozzle going, we're doing great, but I don't have any more line. Yeah, yeah, you're doing great. Versus the backup, that roving linebacker. If you're luxury, you have the luxury of having three people on the line. It's the third guy, who is you know dragging some line to the base of the stairs, going back outside, dragging some more, dragging some line up to the top of the stairs, shooting back down, dragging some more line to the base of the stairs, then dragging that up to the top of the stairs. You'll work your ass off, right? And yet. It's critically important, but just not good. That's a perspective. And we have to train guys to understand, look, this isn't fun, maybe, but it's really, really, really important. Because, you know, I always say if you're uh, 12 feet short with the, my, the line, you might as well be a mile and 12 feet short. I mean, it's hard to come up with the 12 feet if it's just not there, you know? Right. So... 
that's that's really what the start of that is. That goes into training, that goes into operations, that goes into engine work, truck work, the work of the chief officer, everybody is that perspective of knowing I have my game plan, my incident action plan, attack the fire, back up the attack, come to exposures, vent and search. I have those things happening. I feel pretty good about the fire. I love it. I'm going to read you some of the scrapping with a legend. I love that. Thank you. Uh, scrapping with a legend. I love, Chief has the comfy chair. I've read that one. Super excited for the new platform. More excited to hear the goat, Chief Lombardo. So there you go, Chief. Some compliments coming at you. That's nice. uh, Mark I don't know Lone, what they're talking about, but it's very nice. Very nice. That's Scott Slocum out of Florida. Uh, he's the, <laughs> no, again, I don't know what they're talking about this way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Mark alone said, backup does all the work. Knob gets all the high fives. So that, that encapsulates it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then uh, Chief Scott Thompson said this. He said, where, where was it at? I'm trying to find it right here. He said, that's a mega scrap. I'm trying to find I just scroll. But basically, he said, ah, there it is. How about this for the next mega scrap? Lombardo, Pressler, and Salka. So a lot of people chiming in on that one. All right. Um, since you started, and you and I, again, I, I reached out to you and you sent me the, the topics, but this is, this is I mean, uh, 21 line of duty deaths since you hired on. And you were on scene for ten of them, man. That's yeah. a that is a ton. I, I don't know another way to say it. That that is a lot of heartache. Oh, it's horrible. It's horrible. Um, I thought I had PTSD, but I'm too fucked up to realize. It. Uh, <laughs> no, no it, it's not. I, I get it. I get. It. I'm laughing, but I get it. It's very terrible. Um, and uh, you know, it shaped a lot of my career. A lot of things we tried to do. Um, every time we think we are getting better, something happens. Um, we just, just March 1st, we lost a young firefighter, Jason Arno. Um, mm -hmm. there wasn't one, there wasn't two, there was three events at the fire, uh, smoke explosions slash backdrafts. And, uh, I've never seen two at a fire, no less three and just a mind boggling operation, Crews had gone in pretty big, um, three story, but probably um, eighty foot tall, seventy five foot tall, three story building, mm. very large commercial. Um, went a, the whole depth of a block, and uh, they had a a uh, two events come out the front of the place. One was all fire, the other one was all smoke, and then there was one more on the number two or Bravo side of the building. Um, and Jason was on the nozzle, got separated during one of the explosions, got separated, called a mayday, crews got in, they had hands on them. There was a second, uh, and it, I have to check that. I don't know if it was the second or third event happened and the crew who had Jason didn't have Jason anymore and couldn't find him. Right. And they were getting burned and everything else. And sure. they got out, they came back in, they got him. Unfortunately, he succumbed to his injuries. Right. But um, just, it, it, it's been in my career for a long time. Um, I was pretty new when we had five guys killed in an explosion at a uh, illegal radiator repair place in a four-story heavy timber building. And uh, the place blew up and killed five firefighters two civilians and i was a pretty new firefighter and responded to that and uh it was uh you know i was like is this how this is always going to be but uh um it was pretty difficult to deal with um but um you know we all push on and i tried to make that as it said i was on the development team for both our fast program or rip program as well as our survival program for the state just trying to do things that, you know, could get um, us to be a little bit safer. Sure. Over the years, you know, one of the things I realized, like uh, accountability has nothing to do with a tag. I mean, it's great to have a tag. Don't get me wrong. But what I mean by that is truly being accountable. Me as an officer, knowing where my crew is at all times is a big deal that goes beyond a tag. And, and I think that it's important for guys to understand that. 
And in 1983, we had that explosion and it was difficult to tell where everybody was. Um, rigs were blown across the street, you know, so on and so forth. And in 2009, we've lost two firefighters on Genesee Street in a fire in a deli in a bodega and the collapse of the first floor and guys went into the basement. And it was just as hard in 2009 to know exactly where everyone was. One of the things that happened at that fire, we lost Lieutenant Chip McCarthy and Firefighter John Bloom. But Lieutenant McCarthy was there and at the same fire, Lieutenant Dan McCarthy, his brother, Lieutenant Pat McCarthy, his cousin, firefighters Mike McCarthy and Tank McCarthy, or excuse me, John McCarthy and Tank McCarthy were all on scene. Wow. So here's a fire where there's five guys with the same last name, a couple of them related to the person who's the mayday. So wow. we just don't, I don't know that we look at all those kind of little nuanced things beforehand. You know what right. I mean? Stuff's important. Where's Smith? Well, which one? You know, um, sort of important to know which one. So, um, no, you wouldn't even think of that. You wouldn't. I mean, I mean, honestly, I mean, yeah, without a doubt, brother. Yeah. So, and a few in between. We had a couple of collapses. Uh, Lieutenant Jerry. Um, we had a guy, uh, Mike Segan, who uh, uh, really burned to death up in an attic on uh, the Fourth of July. Uh, Donnie Herbert was uh, a great friend of mine. We were firefighters together. When I got promoted out of the rescue, as lieutenant, he took my spot. And Donnie was in a building on uh, Inner Park Avenue. And there was a collapse. And when the collapse occurred, a couple of guys were hurt. They got them moved real quick. When the collapse occurred, they were on the third floor. The staircase and uh, one of the firefighters on it went to the second floor. The stairs were off. Right. So they got Donnie out pretty quick, about nine and a half minutes, got him going. Um, guy uh, who was a firefighter at the time, Joe Victor, he was a uh, retired as a battalion chief recently. Joe gave Donnie mouth to mouth right up in the attic and they got a couple of breaths into him. We got him uncovered. We got him down a ladder to the ground and pretty quickly they had a uh, spontaneous pulse, spontaneous respirations. But he wouldn't wake up. He was unconscious. Mm. And he was unconscious for quite a while. He was unconscious for nine and a half years. Whoa. And uh, nine and a half years later, in April of 2005, that was in December of 2000, or excuse me, 1996. In April of 2005, uh, Donnie was at the facility that he was at for a number of years and raised his head up and said, where's my wife? I want her to come over here. And they were pretty flabbergasted. Sure. Long story short, Donnie was uh, awake for about 40 hours talking to people. There was three, 400 people at the nursing home. Um, no one would go home. And after about 40 hours, he started, about 38 hours, he wasn't making sense again. But before that, he was coherent, knew who everybody was. It became a game. You said, hello. And he said, hi, Mike. Hi, Sandy, to me and my wife. And uh, um. 38 hours he was still talking not making as much sense 40 hours he never said another word and that was in april of 2005 and in february of 2006 donnie passed away mm. i was very 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 pleased i was able to put two of his kids um on the, they were appointed to the buffalo fire department and his other two sons are both buffalo police officers so good kids really good wow kids. yeah that's powerful bro. as a matter of fact the firefighters are both captains now Wow. There's a legacy. Yeah. So. Yeah. No without about it, man. Uh James Mitchellisco said driving force. I know you had others like Chief Salka. Rob Fisher chiming in said, sorry that I'm late to the show on duty. Love the new platform. Mike is one of the legends of the American Fire Service. Looking forward to the show. Me too, brother. I'm with you. Everybody. This is the first time ever we got people from YouTube. We got people from Facebook. I don't see anybody from LinkedIn or Twitter yet, but who, you know, do they count? I'm just saying if they, if they do chime in and, and leave a comment, but it's, it's going great so far. Um, Chief, you said, I would like to talk about training and discipline from multiple perspectives. The firefighter, sure. company officers, chief officers, the department, um, the fire. And the fire service. Service. Yes. So, um, when I look at those five points of command, because I, you know, wind a lot of things around that 
sort of run in my career. But when I look at that, what do I need? I need a few things. I need training. We do for everything we do on the fire ground. I need SOPs and riding assignments. I talk to people all the time. They go, oh, we don't do that, you know. And it's everything from we're volunteers. I don't get the same guys all the time. That's okay. The seat can still have certain requirements to it. Mm. It's a great benchmark in training, right? Mm. You can ride here now. Now you've been training and got enough experience. You can ride here now, right? So on and so forth. Um, and the other thing I need is a good size up. But stepping back to training, um, I look at a lot of stuff different than I think a lot of people, certainly different than a lot of fire chiefs. You know, I think we've gotten pretty crazy with uh, uh, certification stuff and everything else. Sure. I, uh, I have some pro board courses. Do you have some pro board certifications? We have IFSAC and pro board. Or IFSAC. Yeah. So you have IFSAC? So yes, the IFSAC department came out and taught the class? Sure. They did, or did you take it at your... No, no, no. They come out. Well, we also have uh, OSU OK or OSU fire service training in our backyard. So, oh, OK right. So you do that. Right. So like pro board up my way. I have firefighter one and two. I did it for when I was retiring, so on and so forth. But the thing is, what I always say is, you know, here is send us whatever it is. I don't know, twenty five dollars, whatever. We'll you know take a test and we'll send you back a certificate. So you know, Elon Musk. Branson and uh, Bezos want to colonize the moon. What are they going to need? They're going to need intergalactically certified firefighters. So you and I forget the scrap. We can get into that business. Send us 60 bucks. We'll have you take a test. There will be something on oxygen, liquid oxygen, whatever. A couple of questions. And off you go. Yeah, right? you're certified. You go. Here you go. Rubber and stamp it. Certified. Well, but more than certified, we're certifying you because who else it is? Pro board is guys smarter than me. They're making a lot of money, but I never had a pro board class. It was the same class you took in the state always. And when I'm talking about training, I get upset. Um, and this is very global stuff is I talk to guys and they say, well, you know, we tell guys, you know, don't do this, 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 this on the fire ground but you have to do them to get your JPRs done and pass what you have to pass. And I say, you know, if you are in rookie school and I went to rookie school with six weeks today, they're 28 weeks. They're, they're, it's amazing to me. And they want the guy to be everything, right? A high angle underwater bomb squad technician, right? They can do anything. And uh, I just look back, where are we going? Right. Because I have guys that we're telling, you know, like I say, your rookie class, let's say it's 14 weeks, right? And you have three things you tell guys, I know we learned this, but this isn't how we do it. Here's how we do it. You mm -hmm. know what? That's fine. But if you have a 12-week class or 14-week class and you have 103 things that you have to change, we have to go back and look at a different fucking training program. Absolutely. And, and your department, the more Oklahoma fire department's training manual is as relevant as anything. So I'll piss everybody off because you are in Oklahoma, <laughs> but I'll piss everybody off. But can we put up the, uh, uh, door force picture, the cartoon picture, Sammy hit us with the door force cartoon picture. He's coming. Allegedly. We'll see. Allegedly. Oh, okay. So, this isn't my opinion. That is not the direction you push the halog. <laughs> it just isn't, right? That is not the direction you push the halog. That's like page, I think, 167 in the IFSTA man, mm -hmm. right? And, and again, across the United States, well, we have to do that. Well, what if that's not how you do it? Well, we'll teach them that, and then we'll teach it the other way. Right. That's right. insane. That's insane. Don't do something wrong, right? Don't do something wrong. Why does that also today, why does that picture work training one? Any guess? So that's rhetorical. I don't need an answer. But my point is, is that it works in training because if I push, the doors on springs and the springs push back, 
real doors don't have springs mm. and I'm not bashing the door. They do a great job, these different companies that make these, and it's a great training aid. But having said that, that's not how you push. You push the Halligan in the exact opposite direction. And that's a big deal, right? That's It may not seem like a big deal, but it's a big deal. You know, we have standards, right? We have standards that we have to go by. I get in a lot of fights with the NFPA. So can you do the highway shot? It's coming. Say when, Sammy. Okay. All right. So, so I talk to places all over the country, and they're like, oh, you know, we have to have our guys invest when they go to an accident. You know, really, you have 325 square inches of reflective material on your fucking coat. I don't know how much more you need. But I thought, like, the picture, they were worried about the guy in the black pants and black shirt who has nothing reflective on, right? Right. right. It, it's just, like, we get caught up in stuff that is, like, crazy. Um, let's worry about we're, what we're supposed to worry about. We still need to train. Those, you know... I, I do, pl I've told you, I do classes a lot still, but I'll ask people, um, and I'll ask you, Corley, are you a company officer? I Well, battalion chief now, company officer. Oh, you're a battalion chief? For, yes. Oh. A good. Allegedly, allegedly. Allegedly. So when you were a company officer, I'm the battalion chief. Okay. okay. I can't not be in fucking Terry. Fucking Fair I enough. <laughs> so when you were a company officer, I come in and I make it tough Fine, I go, Corley, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to do a search drill today, but you can't leave the firehouse because there's other stuff going on. Mm. So take your company. What could you do? Man, uh, I, we have we have certain signs that say no bunker gear allowed past this point that are plastered all over certain areas. So I would be confined currently to my bay or my back pad or my front pad if I, okay. was gonna, if I was going to do it in gear. So you're going to do it in gear? And what would you do with guys to limit their visibility? I mean, we, I mean, there, there's some, I would probably use some wax paper at least yeah. on, at right. least wax paper. Seal, their hood on backwards, right? Yeah, there you go. There you and go. you know what? That's a, you set some tables up to make some objectives, whatever works. Yes. That's a great basic search drill that we could do all the time, right? So what's an advanced search drill? So I ask this all over the country, and people say to me right away, what do you think the answer is? Ooh, I, oh, I, uh, rope search, large area search. Large area, wide area, and yeah. I go, you know what? Those are. But, you know, I'm a little simpler guy. <laughs> you know what I think makes it a really advanced drill? I start out, I have a 175 or 200-pound mannequin. Right. And then you're going to do a search in heavy heat, smoke and fire. That's all I have to do. And you know what? That's an advanced drill. Oh, yeah. All of a sudden. And it's what we do every day. We think we know how to do it. And you can't practice enough. You know, you asked me, what's a skill that kept you going a long way? Crawling. <laughs> um it stopped me from falling in holes a couple of times. And, I'm, you know, if I can see, okay, I'm obviously not crawling. But the other thing is I never found anybody standing. And I found quite a few people. I got a bunch of medals on my uniform for different rescues. But you know what? I more than once went in a room, found somebody who people, had, firefighters had been in already. Mm. That's frightening. No, absolutely. But, you know, if you don't get on that double bed or bigger, no, you get a king size bed. If you don't get on it, you're missing somebody. Mm. You're <laughs> missing somebody. You're missing the gap between the wall and the bed. And that kind of stuff really, really matters. Going back to the advanced drill, can we throw up the uh, burn room picture? And it's up. Look at that. Um, He's good. He's good. So, the reason I bring this up, I had a friend that went to a recruit school for 28 weeks. And he was in a burn building with fire in it four times. Mm. We are doing, to me at least, such 
an injustice to young firefighters. I have a friend went through a recruit program and the fire involved in the program over weeks and weeks and weeks was, uh, uh, and I'll forget the name, but I don't have to bash the company on here anyway, so I won't, but it was lights. It was this box that had flickering lights in it. Mm. And you can buy these for a lot of money. And I said, oh, does it melt? <laughs> you know, I was like, can I start it on fire? But it's just lights. And the thing is, these guys, grad, guys and girls graduate from recruit school, go to a fire, and one, they don't know when they should get out. But almost as bad, they don't know when they can succeed. Oh, we better get out of here. It's hot. Of course it's hot. You've been in nothing yet in your career. Right. So it's so important to me to be able to train in heat, smoke, and fire. The Fire Department Training Network, where I do work, um, you know, we pride ourselves on that. It's street-level training. And there's really not advanced classes. There's just advanced performance. Right. Really. It really, really is, you know, and you can't do this enough. So the other thing I always like to point out to people and I talk about when I talk about training is to me, maybe it's semantics, but I think there's a difference between training and practice. And practice is a big thing, too. So you and I go to a class and they show us something X, Y, Z, and it seems like a pretty good idea, right? Right. Um, and we adopt that. Um, or they just show us how we're going to the uh, Minuteman load, just for argument. That's what they're going to go to. Um, if we do that and uh, three and a half weeks later we do it again, we aren't going to be real good at it. Sure. You know what I mean? We yeah, I did it absolutely. three times in the class. How many more times do I have to do it? Like every day. you know. And so much runs together. My little feeble brain is at my age runs together. But like people will say, you'll see articles in the fire magazine saying exercises that replicate tasks and duties on the fire ground. Right. And you're going, well, if this exercise is like stretching a hose line or raising a ladder, why don't we just stretch a hose line or raise a ladder and then we'll get exercise in, but we'll also do what we're going to do with a fire, you know? practice yes we don't even need this at the company officer or battalion chief level yes. I need this at the firefighter level and up even to the point of getting dressed you ever watch some of these guys you know they're putting their gloves back on it looks like oj at trial i'll be with you in a couple minutes i'm trying i'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> it's like jesus today you know um we have to practice over and over and over and over and they get mad, you know, the IFF, whatever. I don't mean it in a bad way. I think we all should be professional, but I don't think we're a profession. I think we're a craft or a trade much more than I think we're this profession, like a doctor or an actuary or a lawyer or whatever. No, That's just I like me. that. I like but that. No. We, you know, I never saw that lawyer come home from work the way I look coming home from work. You know what I mean? I got no. beat, you know, and so have you, whatever. Uh, um, so we have to train company officers. We should train every single day. I don't know why you can't stretch a line every day. Right. I, mean, I just don't know why you can't. So we went to EMS calls in Buffalo. We don't have ambulances or anything. It's a private company. So we just would go. So when we'd go to an ambulance EMS call, if that was the first run of the day, when we were done, we'd go back to the rig, get dressed, and stretch the line. Mm. So it was the third floor apartment. We went to the third floor with a dry line and then put it back. It took us five minutes. But we got pretty good at it. I had a friend we talked about, at least from uh, Ohio, and they did it. You know, they were down to 44 seconds getting a line and two guys at the door masked up, ready with water. That's what you want to be. Right. I don't want to time you with a fucking calendar. Excuse right. me. No, it's the internet. <laughs> You're want, safe. You're safe. I don't want to time you with a calendar. You know, I want to time you with a stopwatch. Yes. 
And that's a big, big part of this, you know? And I went, I sort of backtracked a little. The one thing I would talk about too is um, a little bit is uh, standards because it alludes to the IFSTA manual thing. It alludes to the NFPA, you know, 325 square inches in a certain dimension you must have on your coat. And I'm not saying that's not important. However, do you have a tower ladder and more? Yes, sir. Yep. Where yes. in the bucket, where are the controls, Chief? Front, side? No, they're on the side, yes. In the bucket. Yes. They're on the side. So does right and left go right and left? Man, you're really challenging me now because I haven't been in that thing since we got it. But so here's the reason I bring it up. No, go ahead. So I'll step back one. I have pictures of two aerial ladders made by the same manufacturer with the turntable controls. They're aerials, not buckets. The, air, the controls are both on the right side, the officer side of the aerial. And one goes raise, rotate, extend. And the other one goes extend, rotate, raise. Wow. Could you imagine getting in a Ford going, well, this the one, the gas pedal's on the right. Right. Oh, Ford is Chevy. This one, the gas pedal's on the left. Right. Right. And we hire, I'm one of them, slightly dyslexic people sometimes. I don't want you to have the lady in your arms with one foot in the bucket, one on the windowsill going, Mike, move me a foot closer. And I got a 50 50 shot. But fuck, I went the wrong way and you go right. to a bloody death. But my point is, that's not an NFPA standard. Ah, that don't matter. Right? That doesn't matter. Right. And that annoys me. Um, why in the world wouldn't those controls go in the direction of travel? Right? Right would be right, not up and down for right and left. And it seems like little stuff until it's the one time you're getting out of the bucket you want to be closer. Yes. And that's the kind of stuff that I get pretty upset about. I get upset too. I came from a, Buffalo, New York in 2006 was the second poorest city in America. Just like the Bills, we can't be number one of anything. But I, uh, in 2006, I was the boss. I was the fire chief. And I had a guy who on his own was on an NFPA committee. Paid for everything, everything. Ground ladder committee. Anybody have a ground ladder with the hooks on both ends? He's really the reason why. Nice, nice. But the thing is, so I used to try and get him time off, but he would do everything himself. And I was like, can't the NFPA pay for that? So they'll pay for one fire prevention guy, as a, they call it a scholarship, in certain um, standards. But like the fire and the others, so you know what you end up with, Corley? You end up with a guy who is a firefighter, but, you know, I work for ABC company on the side. Right. That's right. sort of like who I'm here for, but not really. Right. right. And what a system. What do you think? So in 2014, we're talking about almost a decade ago. What do you think the uh, head of the NFPA made? Oh, brother, you'd be, I'd be shoot, I'd be ballparking and missing mildly. 300 grand too much. That, I think that'd that's be a too lot much. of money, right? That's a lot. I think that'd be too much, especially back then. I don't know. I don't know so where it's 10 going. years ago, almost, he made $4.1 million. What the... You can't let it pay for what? a firefighter to come to a standards committee meeting. What? <laughs> God's honest truth, $4.1 million. Holy shit. Yeah, everyone should know that. <laughs> No, yes, that, that might be the that might be the truth bomb of the night. Holy crap! Yeah, everyone should know that four point one million dollars ten years out. ago. Ten, oh, ten years ago, right, right, right. He didn't get. Okay, sorry, didn't... sorry, sorry. Okay, oh, it's crazy. Let me just. I got to look at one thing. I don't want to get it wrong. Okay, no, no, no. Yeah, four point one million. They had a two hundred and seven million dollars surplus, and of course, they're tax exempt. What the fuck? <laughs> of course they're tax exempt. And all I'm saying is, is that this drives the fire service. And a lot of manufacturers drive the fire service. I mean, a lot. When I got on a fire, well, 
how many ground how many feet of ground ladder you need in a quint? Any guess? Ding ding ding, 85 feet. Okay, what do thank you need you. on an aerial? Ding ding ding, 115 feet. What did you need on an aerial in 1977 when I started? Would you guess? More think, or less? Man, I'm trying I'm trying to guess which way I, I need to go here, but I'm saying less. 264 feet. Ooh, okay. Okay. I, I guess wrong. So the only thing that's gotten shorter is firefighters, not buildings. Wow. Right? wow. Who's running that? Us or manufacturers? Do you have a yeah. 50 foot ladder on that tower ladder? I've got to, I've got, no, we don't have, we don't have a banger. I, I, we don't. And I'm going to read some of these comments that are coming. Uh, uh -oh. the, the standards are written and the ones who benefit the most are manufacturers there's your lead in for the scrap. Definitely have to get vendors off the NFPA. Sorry, I'm not getting everybody's uh who said these. Um Lombardo for NFPA president, make <laughs> firefighting great again. That's from Mark. I'll take half the salary. <laughs> there you go. No doubt. Brother. <laughs> Two million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll endorse him and I'll just take a tip <laughs> of the bonus. Uh no, amazing, amazing. Drop the Jeff Stone said, drop the mic, pick up the pitchforks. I had no idea, brother. You just blew my no, mind. I don't think most people do. So there is the one thing I would re recommend to everybody. There is in the NFPA a open comment period when they change, make a new standard, whatever. And I would encourage everybody to try and get involved in that. Because we can't fix it from within, but maybe we can have a little effect from without. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because there's talk of a 1700 standard. So 1710 is the career fires, fighters, firefighting standard. 1720 is the volunteer. They want to come up with a 1700, and it would be how you fight a fire from Hawaii to Maine. Everywhere in the United States, you do certain things. And that sounds good until you start to realize, like, there's places in the country that don't have a basement, for instance. Right. Oklahoma. So, Oklahoma has this many basements. Exactly. And we're going to get into basements. We're going to get into basements. Into that. I'd yes. like to. It's a big yes. deal. No, people have asked. But, but um, no, but all I'm getting at is, is that we need to be able to work on that. Yes. Everything I saw, you talked about deaths. The other thing I saw in my career that's been whatever, um, challenging, I'll say, because okay. it's not all bad, but just challenging. It seems anytime a guy dies in fire combat, we carry three or four pounds more stuff. I mean, really, it's it's no, no, know, and that and that that's a great state. I mean, that that's a powerful statement because no one wants to say that. In the in the wake of someone passing or or making the ultimate sacrifice, but it's the truth. So here's here I'll give you one. Here I'll Go. give you one. Um, <clears throat> somewhere over history, guys have run out of air and died in a fire. We all know that. Yes. Right? However, having said that, do you know how much you can get a bottle? So we have thirty minute bottles, forty five minute bottles, sixty minute bottles, and now seventy five minute bottles. So fatigue is killing us. We have 100 guys die a year. Half of them die of heart attacks and strokes. And we're giving you gear that weighs five pounds more and SCBAs that weigh 20 pounds more in the interest of safety. And it you got to step back and go, I think we're missing the forest for the trees a little yes. bit. Yes. There was a guy, he was a pretty brave guy. I will defer to him any time. There was a guy uh, who was the head of the Boston Fire Department, Frank Christian. And uh, they had gone into bunker gear. And he had proposed that ladder companies and the rescue companies could wear fire retardant pants, but regular pants like the West Coast used to. Right. right? And then a coat and a helmet. And people were like, oh, my God. And they found after they went to this program with bunker gear and everything, um, burn injuries went down like 35%. That's a good thing. What they missed, though, well, they didn't miss it, but what a lot of people miss, the Boston fire departments 
incident of cardiac events went up 300 percent oh wow i mean i'm all i'm getting at is is that like we have to make sure we see the forest for the trees right we right. are is this really better for us or am i doing something that i feel better about it but it really isn't doing much right buffalo, oh, new, no. york is, buffalo new york is two and a half story frames i mean we have 40 story buildings and stuff but our fire problem is pretty big 10,000 square foot wooden two and a half story frames 100 130 years old almost all of them balloon frame balloon frame. right right and uh in new york state in 2000 i think it's 8 they went to a bailout system now not a rule not a standard it was a new york state legislated law meant well came out of black sunday in new york city sure sure meant well right i vehemently was against it we had always given guys 50 feet of rope with a hook um we did the single slide wrap it around you no not no nothing just put your hands together do you know what i mean yes right worked fine for a million years and now we were going to a bailout system that was multiple pounds it was, I said, I'll have a guy hung up on something with the bailout system before anybody goes out the window. With it. And I, it's just a case of, we got to make sure what we're doing really is going to make sense. Right. Um, I mean, we could get into fire development stuff um, for the rest of the evening, but you know, the only thing I will leave you, not leave you for the right. program, but about that is this topic. This topic is, you know, one of the things I see is guy was doing a class the other day and I was sitting in watching it. I still like to learn stuff too. Right and on. he had um, paper and a wooden paper, class A combustibles, 8,500 BTUs, um, polyurethane, uh, 12,000 BTUs, polystyrene. And I might have those off a little. Sure, sure. 27,000 BTUs. So I don't discount or deny that at all. But what I say in my classes is, because this guy was going on and on, fires have changed, fires have changed, fires have changed. So I said, in my classes, I ask people, when have fires changed? They go, last 20 years. I go, so this is the God's honest truth. <laughs> We're the bravest, right? Is it, aren't they called the bravest almost everywhere in the country? The firefighters were the bravest, right? We're not the brightest. <laughs> so, so I'm doing a class. I go, when was 20 years ago? Guy raised his hand. He's God is my judge. He said, you know, 1960s, 1970s. Right. So, <laughs> well, you didn't we fail are the, not the brightest. Okay. okay. I go, you didn't fail the fire thing. You failed like third grade. Right. <laughs> you know? right. We're in trouble. But um, the reason I bring it up is because I hear that every day, 20 years ago, articles, uh, right. podcasts, everything. Fires changed 20 years ago. Now, I think there's things that have changed. I think things like windows, some of the construction things have changed. But polyurethane was invented by a guy in the Dow Corporation in 1931. Oh, wow. Polystyrene was invented in 1936. And they didn't invent those and then sit on them saying, let's sit on them for 70 years. They'll be a game changer. Right. I'm, old. I'm old. I've never sat on Cecil and hemp in my life. You know, people talk about a legacy living room. Legacy was 1955. And here's the crazy one. I think there was more plastics then. Oh, wow. I remember oh, wow. being a firefighter, walking into houses, and a real common thing in the 1970s and 80s was to have a guy have a 500 album record collection. Right. And the other one was four huge shelves along the wall with VCR tapes. The fire, you'd see it from Oklahoma. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> You'd see the fire from Oklahoma. Today, everything, everything you ever, every song ever written, you can put on here. Yeah. 
right? Every song yeah. ever written can be on your phone. Yeah. So really, you know, what are, where are we at? One of the things that upset me a lot about the uh, fire study stuff was it took us forever to do what we did forever. They finally did do our base operations, but it was well after it all started. Right. So all I'm getting at is, is that we've changed everything we do some places. I have guys that tell me, oh, we would never open the roof. We're really, we're missing the point. I go, why? What would happen? They go, fire would come out. It had turned to fire. I go, and why is that bad? That's a good thing. I opened that roof. Now, I'm not talking about the engine isn't even here yet. Right, right. I get the windows on the top floor and the fires on the top floor. It's going to be better. It really is. Oh, no, no, you don't. And so I'll go one further. It's science, right? I'm not a scientist. It's science, right? But how about this? Can you remember, and I'm thinking it's 25, 30 years ago, a different science that told us different stuff? So, again, rhetorical for everybody out there. Who remembers positive pressure attack? Right? That was science. Don't take the hose line off first. Take the fan off, put it in the front door. First thing. And I was like, gee, that sounds a little crazy. And uh, fire's knocked down. I get it. But first thing, put the fan in the door. Absolutely. And they'd show videos and they'd have all their telltales and their scientific equipment. And they'd show the guy who was able to walk in and get the victim. And I always used to be like raising my hand like, but what if the victim's on the other side of the fire? Right. right? You turn the fan on the, you know, it isn't a little square box house. It's a 4,000 square foot. Right? Good size yes. house. Yes. With the victim here and the fire there, right? You blow the fire that way, it can't be good for them. Right? I'm VES and it can't be good for me as you roast me as I'm trying to get in the second floor window. So it's relative. All of it is good. It's good to have science look at a lot of the stuff we're doing. But understand that there's a little bit of everything to it. I find it interesting. It has seemed to have slowed down like put the curtain up in front of the door and you know don't ventilate anything has seemed to calm down a little bit right which I right. think is a good thing coordinated fire attack first of all is a good thing but secondly is not new we took a line in as they took the line in other guys were getting the windows they weren't getting the windows when the engine wasn't in the block they were getting the windows when the engine was coming in the door but I'm happy then. People say, oh, no, not till they, I see water coming out. Like I had guys tell me, I wouldn't vent a window till I see water coming out. I go, they're okay. They're done now. They don't need you anymore. We can close the ladder company. You know, I don't know what you're doing. No, I'll take the windows. I'd much rather something happen in front of them than behind them. Beautiful. Right? They're crawling all through this place, right? It's black. It's hot. We put the curtain up. And it got hot enough to get everything going. We're in trouble, right? So I'd rather do that. And again, it's not it's not 100% by any stretch. But, you know, and people say, well, you don't ever transition. Well, we didn't call it that. But we certainly pulled up the places that were sailing, that we were hitting in a window to keep it off the exposure. You know, we have a lot of exposures that literally you can't walk between. Right. You know, they're 100 years old. I don't know how they built one of them, right? The one I figured out, the other one, there ain't room. I don't know how you put the siding on it, you know? But so <laughs> we pulled up. We absolutely used a hose line on the exterior to knock down that outside fire, right? But we also then got in and put that fire up. You know, I've seen places that, oh, no, no, we're going to hit. And it's smoke up there. Well, that's not quite the same because... You know, people say, well, where's the fire? Well, it's in that room. I go, well, I've been doing this 45 years, and it might be in that room or out in the hallway or across the hall or in the basement coming up a void space or a lot of places. But right from this street, I can't tell you exactly where that is. Right, right. And that's what I think gets missed a lot. I really do. Yeah, so I love it. I'll get you. No one will be watching by the end. 
So. No, no, brother, you're killing it. No, people are watching. People are asking questions. I love it, man. I, when you get into tactics, you start getting into this. This is this is the bread and butter. Um, I have to I have to throw this question at you. Vigilante question of the week. I always ask my vigilantes. That's my private group. Uh, questions they want to ask of the guests. So I posted you like a week ago and said, "What questions do you want to ask him?" And everybody put their questions in. But the one that came up that I really wanted to throw at you because you have a good. Uh, Man, such a perspective on it. But it comes from Bradley Valley in court. He said, what advice would you give to a firefighter that is on a volunteer fire department and then gets on a full-time fire, uh, full-time job and is getting negative vibes from some of the uh, the colleagues at the volunteer fire department? So getting the the problem is at the volley house? Yeah, at the volley house. After you, oh. you, were, you were at the volley, then you made it. Yep. Uh, yep. Yeah. So... I think that the answer to that is you can't worry about it. I mean, people just get jealous. What can you do? Um, yay for you, <laughs> right? Yay for you. I've been a volunteer firefighter. I've been a career firefighter. There were people, we had less of the volunteers getting upset as I'd have, you know, guys, oh, you shouldn't be doing that. You're taking somebody's job. I go, well, there's no paid guys yet. So I don't think I'm taking anybody's job where I live, you know? Um, and, and, you know, you just got to look at that. Um, I'm sort of a purist. I'm there to go to the fire and put the fire out. Right. So consequently, um, I'm not, I just never cared about that stuff. And there's many things like that. You know, I uh, got promoted to Lieutenant. I had seven years, which isn't a tremendous amount of time, but it's, I had been to a lot of fires. I had spent five years in the rescue. We went citywide to every fire in the city. So I went to some fires. Nice. But people said, well, you know, I, I get asked the same sort of thing. Like, what do you do if you have senior people? I go, well, I use them to death, right? I use them like crazy. Let's help with this drill, blah, 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 all that stuff. But always remember when everything else is said and done, I'm still in charge. You yes. know, I mean, if you're, if you have... You know, I'm, I'm, I have seven years on Corley. You have 19. Okay. And I come to your firehouse as your new boss and you have questioned, oh, well, do you know, blah, 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 blah. Hey, listen, you know, I wasn't on an engine la that, that long. We're on an engine. What kind of tips can you give me? Hey, when we're training with the guys, I want to make sure we're squared away. They're as good as you are. Right. But if it just becomes a push every single day, and it's just unfortunate. You know, this is not a great millennial level um, tactic, but at some point it's every other Thursday, they fucking pay you and I'm in charge here. And if you don't like it, you got to find someplace else to go. Nice. No, because no, no. no, I get there, it. There is a point where, no, they're paying you to be in charge. One of the things that always amazed me and I saw it the most is the very top was everybody gets this idea that I think, I think that there's the good side and the bad side, right? And we had truck committees, okay. right? Apparatus. And I was just telling people, I said, you know, one of the things about being a boss, we had truck committees that Corley come up with this idea on the tower ladder bucket, something to be mounted. Sure. And Tom came up with a completely different idea. And wonders never cease. They're both good ideas. You know, the problem is guys always think, well, one's stupid. No, <laughs> they're both great ideas. Right. You know what it comes down to? At some point, someone, one being the word, has to make a decision. Right. They come to you in, in Moore, Oklahoma, as a battalion chief, the answer they're not looking for is you to say after you, they give you their problem, well, what do you guys think? Right. Well, we fucking talked about all that. We came to you for an answer. And understand as a boss, you're going to make some side not happy. Right. That's going back full circle to the, to the um, gentleman that asked the question. You know, some people aren't going to be happy but just keep doing what you're doing. Right. No one can fault you. You know, I was a, 
in Buffalo, I was always into the job. I was a fire sexual, right? That's what we call it, <laughs> right? It. But, um, you know, and I was always into the job, but I never said everyone else has to be. One little thing I will say, and I'll piss some more people off. And some of these people are my friends. Right. So like, I have friends that talk about them, right? You've seen them. Have you seen that? Yes, about- for them, for them, yes. Them, or it's worth the risk, Kurt, right? Yes. And all that stuff's good. And those are good motivational things. And if that works for you, great. I'd like to think particularly, you know, as a career professional firefighter, I could just get you to do your job too. You know what I mean? So the thing I always say to people is to keep vigilant of is I've seen not many, but I've seen guys in my career who were into everything except doing their job, but they were into the stuff at the fire and they were into this and they knew about that and they knew about this. And they couldn't weren't worth the fiddler's fucking a fire. Now there weren't many of them. Then I also had guys, I had a guy in my crew, Chuck Sardo. Um, he was on my team at the FDIC. I did the live burn there for six, seven years. Right. Chuck was on my team and people would say, did you go to the show? Meaning at the FDIC, we'd always stay a day and go see the floor. Sure. Because yeah, I saw that Mission Impossible movie, you know, <laughs> he'd go to the show. <laughs> but Chuck wouldn't go across the street if the world was on fire. I mean, if they were fighting the fire, not if someone needed help. Yet, right. he was a phenomenal firefighter. Right? People say, what kind of rig do you have? He goes, a real big, long one, red. You know? But knew how to operate it better than anybody in the crew. You know, and we can't lose sight that sometimes the guy really good at the job may not be into it, and the guy really into it may not be that good at it. Having said that, it would be wonderful if I could have a department full of guys that are raring to go rah, 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 rah. We had 750 people in Buffalo. I'm pretty sure that's not going to happen, you know? And the other one that I always take a different tack on, and some people think I'm crazy, people say, well, guys, here just for a paycheck. Well, if you provide enough to earn that paycheck, I'm perfectly okay with that, you know? Heck yeah, hell yeah. You know what I mean? I'm perfectly yes. okay with that. 100%. 100%, man. I love it, brother. I love Dude, everything you said. And and I will say, um, in, in defense of for them, you know, and, and I got Oh, you. no, no. I don't have anything against them. No, no. I know. I know. I will say that that's directed at the people that are really just into it. And, and, and you know, it's worth the risk. That's directed at the people that are really into it. But if you know uh, Firehouse Vigilance and, and and it's the never-ending fight against complacency, because complacency doesn't give a shit who you are. It it just it will reach up and grab you and drag you down into it, you know? And so, so I, how about this? How about me. Battalion Chief Corley Moore? Uh oh. And who's the fire chief? Uh yeah, I've got a fire chief. Who is it? Oh, uh, I won't say that. Fire Chief Smith. Yes. Um they talk to the guys. You talk to the guys. Hey, listen, be ready. You go out on that run, all your gear on, ready to go. You pull up, you never know, right? That's good stuff, right? Do you agree? I mean, I think so. I think so. I was always the guy. I'm older. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> but um, I'm still in the volleys, and a run comes in, I'm dressed. Right. Hoods on, everything's on. Right on. To this day, to the automatic alarm that we go to three times a day. But the reason I bring that up, how about institutional complacency? So I see fire chiefs who say, I want my guys ready, right? Because complacency is hard. You are right. I mean, I always say, I'll talk to a recruit class and I'll say, you know, you have no, the word complacency should, complacency shouldn't even fall into your vocabulary, you know, for the next few years, right? This is all new to you. But you have nine years on and, you know, uh, you're having trouble at home and you don't know how you're paying both the electric, the gas and, the, you know, whatever bills. Absolutely. You're going to the automatic alarm at two in the morning that you've been to twice already this shift. And it is pretty hard to be vigilant as B. I mean, it, yes, we're yes, human. we're human, right? What I get upset at, though, is the department doesn't want you to be that way. 
and yours probably doesn't do this, but I've seen small departments. I go, get an automatic alarm. Who do you send? And they go, well, if it's an automatic alarm, I've seen places. Well, if it's an automatic alarm without a phone call, we send the police. So I, inevitably, especially mm. when I do bigger classes, a yeah. lot of volunteer firefighters, a lot of volunteer firefighters, sometimes there will be a couple of police officers. And I always gotcha. ask, I go, bank alarms, usually bank robberies. They go, no, almost always a false alarm. I go, really? They go, yep. Yeah, the automatic silent alarm at the bank is almost always a false alarm. I go, so do you ever sit with the police chief and say, you know, these bank alarms, we ought to have the fire department go. <laughs> right, right. Right? We right. ought to have an engine go. And they go, and the guy usually by then goes, what are you, crazy? Right. We don't think a thing is sending the ambulance or the police car to the automatic alarm. That's our fucking job. What are we doing? Right? I love it. I love it. What are we doing? Um, we had, uh, I got out of a place. Um, we went to the big medical center. It's a big trauma center in Buffalo, huge hospital, 15 stories, big complex. And we would literally go there easily five times a day between alarms. Then we'd go for helicopter landings to land on the roof. Then we'd go up, right? And I used to think we'd stretch a line. I'd go, what's the chance that the helicopter crashes where we are? <laughs> right? Right, if right. If a 100 yards from here, we can't do anything, <laughs> you know? But having said that, I got dressed. It was my first assignment out of rookies. Okay. I got dressed. <laughs> Every shift, and we go to ECMC, and I'd get off the rig, and I'm just, you know, I'm telling stories out of school, but almost everybody coming in on that run on an 85 degree day was in boots. You know, we didn't have bunker pants in those days. Right, right. We didn't have boots and a helmet on. And I remember in a year and a half, they were all false except for three. <laughs> right. One was a match. One was a room. A crazy guy started the room next door on fire. One was a mattress in a basement that was a tough fire. Okay. And one was this connected building that was a monstrous compactor. Compactor was probably the size of a, uh, you know, a house. Right, right. Fungus. And, uh, but every time I was dressed, stretching a line while everyone was scrambling. Wow. And it is complacency, right? Nope. We fall into that. So if I could talk one more, because I'm a rambling idiot who's old and I forget stuff. Yo, brother, we're loving it. I'm telling you right now, everybody's loving it, me included. But um, one of the things I always talk about search, so the them and and uh, it's worth the risk, all good stuff, really, really is. But the one thing I do hear sometimes, so I had a couple of guys talking one day, and I said, and we do a, a – station at FDTN where this is exactly it. So you're my boss and we're crawling down a hallway. Okay. Doing a search. We're on the truck, me and you are searching. And the, they said the ladies at the end of the hallway and we almost think we can see her. And as you go a couple more feet, you drop. You're unconscious. Well, I don't know how to tell you. I'm getting you out. And I've had people tell me, oh, no, no, no. We signed on for this. I'm going for the lady. And I go, well, I'll never go in a fucking burning building with you again. <laughs> because I go places, you go places that are scary and dangerous because we know somebody's going to come and get us. And the thought that, you know, that is happening is a little crazy. So the other thing I have, too, that I integrate internet and I use it in classes is I like to think that there is like almost everything else we do. There's strategic search parameters and procedures and there's tactical search. So what do I mean? So I'm a battalion chief, just like you stand in front of a three-story garden department. Do you have those? Oh yeah. Yeah. Tons of them, right? Oh yeah. They're, they're sprouting up like weeds. So Got a good fire on the second floor, and a woman runs up to you. You got one engine on scene. Woman runs up to you and says, uh, my two kids are trapped on the third floor. Right, right. So as she says that, here comes ladder one. 
right? Or in more, what's the ladder number? Oh, we got ladder one, ladder four. Oh, oh, wow, I'm so happy. Some place I go, it's like 263. Okay, like, no, you get 262 of them? They go, no, 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 just one of them. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, we got so, the one, two, three, four. We good, we good. Yeah. So ladder one's walking up to you and you're like, thank God. And right. you're about to tell them, where are you telling them to go? Right? No, where the, yeah, no, go. yeah. Third Make floor, the lady says her kids are up there. Make the grab, Just yeah. as you're about to tell the officer that, right? And I was a hands-on guy. I'm Italian, so it comes naturally. But, like, if it was really dicey, you know, people say, did you do what radio channels? And I go, no, I put my hand on Corley's shoulder. Said She said her two fucking kids were trapped up there. It's shitty. Get going. No. Right? But keep Yes. It. But the thing is, so as Corley and Ladder 1 are walking up, the next thing before I can say a word is mayday, mayday, mayday. Engine one to command. We're on the second floor. We're trapped. Where's the truck going now? Because my thing is, sorry about your kids, lady. I mean, I'm not going to say that, of course. Sure. Truck one, go get them. Ooh. Sorry. And a lot of people, oh, I'm going to get the kids. Well, I'm not. I will as soon as I can. And as soon as we get more people, but engine one's trapped on the second floor, I got to go get engine. Hey, and here's the deal. I, I, I'm not going to lie to you, Chief. The first time I ever got to see you speak was in Wichita, Kansas a couple years ago. And I've never seen you before then. And I haven't seen you since then. And other than tonight, and you, you kind of laid out the same type of scenario. And I realized, holy shit, what would I do in that scenario? You know, it was a, it was a, it was a, unbelievable gut check for me to say he's right it's it's the difference between tactical and strategic strategic where i don't like it where i'm all for the them and no 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 without a doubt where i'm a hundred percent for them is when i see departments have statements written before a fire that talk about when you wouldn't search i'm gonna not talk about now there's rooms i can't get in i'm not superman if it's fire out of every inch of it we got to put knock the fire down but are we going to search that room the answer to me is not right yet but we are going to search that room because we have to be able to get in um they have to knock it down a little bit we just aren't superhuman but we are getting in there we're not leaving that grandma to be found by the board up guy or the fire investigator or God 100%. The and, and to be and to be clear and to be clear is that we're talking about an extreme situation where it is my guys versus it, it's an extreme situation to to say the ultimate how are you going to think about it and what i would say is most guys fortunately will never face it in their career right you know what i mean oh, but it should Somewhere along the line, you should think about it. Think you know, about it. Run it through your run it, run it through your decision making algorithm, whatever that may look like. So the other one I always get in trouble for is risk benefit. Okay. So I always say, you know, risk a lot, save a lot, risk a little, save a little. I don't know what a little is. That's me. Fair enough. I don't know what a little is. Is that your finger? <laughs> is that your toe? I don't know what a little is, but right. I always ask people, do you do it every time? They go, absolutely. I go, I bet you don't. <laughs> and they go, no, 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 no. We do it every time. I go, really? And I go, uh, I think we do something else. I think we do risk aversion. We wear an SCBA. We put a seatbelt on. 25% of us get killed coming and going. Put a seatbelt on. I got on. The first place I went to, or the second place I went to was Ladder 14. We had a 1968 American La France tiller. It didn't have seat belts. Like, people don't believe me. They, they weren't on it. Right. There was no such thing, right? Right. But the thing is, today, I had a friend, it's a few years ago now, um, they were on an aerial ladder. It rolled over onto the aerial, so it went twice, right? And then burned. And all oh, wow. four guys had seat belts on. And we're fine. Banged up, but fine. Right. It works. We avert risk. Things like washing your clothes in your hood. I didn't have a hood when I got on, but we didn't wash it. You rinsed it off, you know? 
But we do those things today and they're great. They do avert risk, right? They really do cut down our chances. Then there's absolutely five, 10, maybe 15% of the time, particularly you as a battalion chief, but company officers and everybody else has to go, no, you know what? We're not going in there. Right, right. What I mean about doing it every time is what is the second leading cause of firefighter deaths? I just said it. Coming and going, right? Driving. Mm -hmm. Driving. Coming and going. So second most, 25% of line of duty deaths are coming and going. So a run comes in and more your next night tour, right? And you're sitting there and the call, get, I, I would assume something like, hey, boop, make some, something makes some noise. You got tones, yeah. <laughs> Everybody runs and gets right. dressed. The lights come on, the doors go up. And be, when that's happening, you go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hang on. It's dark out. Are we going to go? Do you do that? No, do absolutely that. not. But it's 25% of our deaths. Right. I'm with you. And the point I'm getting at is, is none of us do that. Right. <laughs> right. 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 That. right. There's things we just take for granted. Right. We don't do a risk benefit analysis on every run we go to. We do them beforehand and we do things like wear a gloves and a mask when we have a sick person. Right. We didn't do that before. I remember when I got in, you had blood all over Blood you. all over, yes. The, the yeah. mark was if you did CPR and had blood on your face. Yeah. Yes, the mark of so, honor. So we do a lot of things today which are good to avert risk. And then there absolutely is time where we have to say, absolutely not, not right, right. now. But I, can't, but I can't put that in the system beforehand. Chief, you are... Uh, uh, 100% amazingly entertaining to talk to you, but I want to include the audience, so I'm going to interrupt you I and say, apologize. no, 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 I love it. I love it. That's why it's so hard to do. McGinn said, ramble on, I love it. And this is what I want everybody to do, because this is the first time ever to have multiple streams. Uh, just uh, put in there, I'm on Facebook, put in there where you're, where you're watching from geographically, along with Facebook or YouTube. I don't care. And just do that. So it'll be fun to see how many pop up. Uh, but that being said, they said, ramble on. I love it. Steve Frankenfield said, I'd listen to this. And he put it in quotation mark, rambling old idiot for hours. Uh, <laughs> Scott Thompson said, there are bosses losing their mind right now, screaming, don't listen to the scrap. And I love that. <laughs> uh, Scott Vadekin said, in all caps, truth. Woody from... Woody COD said nuclear bomb drop. Woody COD said bomb. So he likes bombs. Um, uh, Andrew Peter said, I tell my probies that listening to the ramble of a tenured member is gold in the coffee pot at midnight. Pour the late night coffee and you'll be wealthy. Uh, Jeff Stone said, nobody wants to hear the truth, chief. Big difference between a mayor's chief and a firefighter's chief. I'll take, I lost it. Oh, everybody responded with Facebook and YouTube. There we go. I tried to catch it up, but amazing amount of responses. Uh, Chief, had a guy tell me he was in a class where they told him, yeah, there's so much going. Chief, yes. So many people posting. Thank you, thank you, thank you. There it is, all over the world, chiming in from Facebook and YouTube. We'll look at it. Chief Lombardo has a way of looking at the most popular fire cliche and from another angle, there's levels to this stuff. That comes from Scott Vatican. Thank you, brother. All right. Um, I'm going to throw some more. This is coming from the audience. And there's a lot of questions, Chief. I haven't even touched the first one yet. So Marco, I, Marco Isom says, what was your largest incident? And can you share a few lessons learned? Big question. I know, but I'm throwing it at you. So probably the... Largest tough, but the most complex thing was we responded to the explosion in 1983. Um, probably about 160 buildings damaged, 20 or 15 or 20 of them on fire. Um, civilians trapped, firefighters trapped, firefighters Oof. killed. Oof. And 
the only reason I'm at all hesitant is I was a pretty new firefighter. So I operated, but I just sort of did what I was told. You know what I mean? We, uh, we jumped off, I jumped off the top of the rig with our turret demountable at that time off the engine. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> another guy in my crew was in rookie school with me, grabbed two, two and a half, and we ran forward. There was a big church on fire. But um, I didn't comprehend or understand the gravity of it. Like it was on Nightline. Remember Nightline? The yeah. TV show? Oh, was yeah. That Nightline? I never saw it. But, and there was no cell phone. So, we couldn't contact our families or anything else, you know. The news reports were worse than the truth. But I've been to some other major operations, um, as you can imagine, um, some fun ones. Um, we went to a uh, – one of the things we were very fortunate, I thought, in doing is we went to Canada usually once or twice a year. So it's nice to go to another country. Sure. You know? Um, one time we went, they had a 700 foot ship coming through the canal, the Welland Canal, and they raised the bridge. And it was one of these bridges, right? Straight up and down lift bridge oh. instead yeah. of this, right? Right, right, right. And the lift bridge goes up, 27 foot sailboat goes through, lift bridge comes down, 700 foot freighter hits it. Right. Now, I, <laughs> what I find the most amazing thing, guy passed a drug test. So <laughs> the bridge. Fair keeper he goes god is my judge i didn't see the big one but um it ripped the top you know how big freighters are the the uh, wheelhouse is at the back right right it ripped the whole wheelhouse off and then it burned and burst into flames oh wow we operated at that with some companies we had another one we had a guy stuck in a uh, ship um they were salvaging the ship and he had a uh Huge 50,000 pound anchor chain fall on him. Oh, and wrap around him. So, every time the links were probably that big, one link. So, we went up from Buffalo, it took us about 40 minutes, 35 minutes to get there. And we had him out in about two and a half hours. All he had was broken ankle. So, it was pretty oh, good. Oh, wow. Yeah, that, that's a good outcome. It was a great outcome. And a great example of, you know, we ended up cutting with a arc air torch, a window and what they call the chain locker to get through to him. We were basically able to untie his shoes and that's what we got him out. Oh, we basically got him out. But we had plan B was we were putting five foot steel rods through the chain pile and then putting uh, come alongs um, on them pulling. Just to keep it. Otherwise you just pull one length. Right, one right. Piece length. No, that and makes sense. They, the ultimate was we had a couple of guys at the far end of the pile just cutting away manageable pieces, and we're going to go all the way if we had to. But I always used it as a great example of it was a great plan A, plan B, plan C. Wow, no, no, no thing, doubt. And the only thing I always say is, and I'm a big procedures and writing assignment guy, like I told you earlier, some people say, oh, we don't have the people, blah, blah, blah. To me, it's, it brings chaos to the fire. Or it removes chaos from the fire. No. But, you know, it's very, very, very difficult to have a good plan A or plan B if you don't have a plan A. If you don't have plan A in the first place that we always do, plan B will be a bitch to come up with on the fly. Mm. You know, I see places that, you know, they tell the guys going down the road, you grab this, you grab this. Come on, we can't get better where we're have tool assignments at least in certain positions. Right. 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 Just little stuff, you know, right. just little stuff. Um, and it's amazing the places that don't do any of that. So. No, I love it. Hey, now, one thing I want to get to and two, two reasons I'm going to it right now. One, I live in Oklahoma. We're known for, we're known for one thing, especially in more Oklahoma, it's where the planes it, tornadoes come in and we they level us. That's what they do. Uh, second thing is we're the river bottom. We have no basements, period. We have no basements. And in my jurisdiction, we have no balloon frame construction. Um, so I'm blessed in my uh, tactics, if that makes sense. I'm very sure. blessed. Um, long story short, 
I want to talk about basement fires because so many people had a lot of questions about basement fires. And I have to honestly throw my hands up and say, I can't help you. But I have one of the most prolific persons who might have dealt with some basement fires in his life. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw basement fires to you. Okay. And while you do that, I'm going to leave you here and I'm going to hit the head. I don't know if you need to, but I'm going to leave you okay. alone and let you talk. I'm good. Okay. It's all yours. Thank you. Away. So I would appreciate. Um, so talking about basement fires. So what's our basic basement fire um, tactical plan? Stretch a line to the egress point of the basement, usually in the kitchen of a private house. Um, in a in a commercial building like with stores, usually at the rear of the building. None of them are absolute perfect, but usually, right? Um, get a line to there, protect that egress, and either get down the stairs, put the fire out, or protect it while someone can come from another way. So having said that, you know, how are we doing that, right? Going down the stairs, it's a concerted effort. It's not like, well, I'm taking a line down the stairs. Yeah, you are, but you got to think about it. You know, you got to have enough line to make it to the bottom of the stairs. You have to make a concerted effort. We're going down the stairs. Here we go. And I'm going with the nozzle. When I get to the bottom of the stairs, I have to get out of the way. Why? Because if I don't, as my boss or whoever the backup is comes down, they're going to be behind me. And I'm going, ooh, it's better down here than it was a little bit up. Where are they? A little bit up. Their head's just about at the ceiling height of the basement if I don't get out of the way, right? I got to get out of the way so that they can get down and we can operate. Um, in both those it's a tough, tough, tough fire. Um, particularly for places that don't have a ton of them, it's a horrendously tough fire. But even places that have them all the time, a lot of people operate on them and don't give a lot of thought to them. They really, really are a dangerous operation that we run into. Um, we look at, we look at um, basement operations, you know, what are you doing? So, um, Corley just talked about no, no, uh, no uh, balloon frame. Corley also, um, oh, sorry about that. Corley also, you said not a lot of balloon frame. Also, a lot of newer construction, like 70s and up. Oh, I'm here. I just got back. I'm sorry. You hear me? I hear you. I hear you good. I heard seventies and up. Yeah. So, do you have? A, you said not a lot of balloon frames. So, do you have a lot of construction seventies and up? We do. We do. Almost everything in my jurisdiction is nineteen sixties forward, mainly nineties forward. But yes, even the sixties. So, if yes. you were in a place that has basements, you don't. I realize. Right. But with that same kind of construction, understand that every basement you're going over is probably constructed of lightweight right um engineered trusses for floor joists right right no um, 100 yes you know i go into places in buffalo new york and literally there are trees in the basement you still see bark wow they're 220 year old buildings you know um they will last a long time but they'll be tough so the bigger thing about basements, before we get into specifics, can we put up the basement slide, the uh, uh, the data slide? It's up. So take a look at that. Everybody, if you can see it, there's a couple of things about it. The first thing is that it's just done in my kitchen, right? This is not a scientific thing. I try and keep up with basement fires. If the slide is mostly... The last 20 years, mostly the last 20 years, mm -hmm. um, with the exception of a couple outliers. One is 19, and I want to get the right year. One is 1995, um, I believe. Yeah, the Seattle? Yeah, so there's yeah, that year. 
that year there was uh quite an outlier year there was eight yeah there it is yeah 95 yeah because you had yeah. seattle pittsburgh and fdny all with the eight yeah there was eight right um, 99 so i tried to keep it roughly two decades then of course Columbus, Ohio's in there in 87. Anybody, if they've ever heard of the John Nance drill, John yes. Nance was a lieutenant in Columbus, Ohio, fell into a commercial basement of a department store, fell into the basement. This wasn't a nine foot high ceiling. This was a 12 or 15 foot high ceiling and wow. multiple attempts to get him out. Yes. And then the other one, of course, is 23rd Street in 1966 in New York, 12 guys. But all the way to, there was one literally a couple of weeks ago in Leonardtown, Maryland. There's tremendous, tremendous uh, uh, comparisons with these where they are the same thing happening over and over. Guys pull up, get off the rig, walk in the place, fall into their death. Right. Um, Frederick County, Maryland, Howard County, Maryland, 20 miles apart. Well, a couple of years apart, both Chevron houses, you know what I mean? Like the Chevron stripes, big McMansions, both hit by lightning, both first guy in the place fell in, died. Yeah. Um, just tough. And the list goes on and on. So the reason the date is important, you see that, right? And people may go, well, one guy, one guy, one guy, two guys. Right, fourteen is uh, three guy, uh, four guys in twenty fourteen. Right, and, and people may not think that's a big deal. So, there's a site, uh, data not drama. Are you familiar? Yes. Yeah, uh, Bill Carey, absolutely. Bill Carey. So, yes. one of the things interesting is the for the last roughly twenty five years, the firefighter combat line of duty, line of duty death. Um, percentage is about 4.5 a year. In mm -hmm. other words, out of roughly 100 guys who die a year in fires, four and a half, about four to five guys die fighting a fire. Right. Many other ways we do it, but fighting a fire. Interior yeah. firefighting operations. Right. So that's yes. pretty startling, right? That's if we didn't know that, if we didn't really look at stuff, that's pretty crazy, right? So now let's add one more thing. And Corley, it's great to be with you. How many parts of the United States don't know what a basement is? Absolutely. So you don't, right? I mean, you know what it is. I don't mean that. I, you know I, no, I, 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 I don't have to worry about it tactically, yeah. strategically. Yes. And a lot of the Florida, a lot of coastal Texas, Mississippi, Alabama. Absolutely. Uh, Georgia, the Carolinas. A lot of the country doesn't have basements. So now Perfect. you start to realize 4.5% are tra traumatic combat line of duty deaths. And then if we also put into the mix that a whole bunch of the country doesn't have them, it's a frightening, horrific cause of death for firefighters. I mean, horrific. Um, you know, we have guys literally get off fire trucks, walk in and fall to their death and die. Right. Literally. Right. Um, Coleraine, Ohio, two firefighters go in, a firefighter and a captain actually go in. They start down the kitchen, the stairs from the kitchen. They get to the base of the stairs. The officer's smart and says, this is not good. Let's go. Went up to the, t got all the way to the top of the stairs. Okay. Took one step in the kitchen to go out the door and fell back into the basement and died. Right. And the story goes on and on and on and on. So the reason I bring it up, it's not even new. It's not just uh, new modern construction. It's happening in old construction too. It's always been a huge killer of firefighters. So the things I look at, again, I told you I'm a procedures guy, right? So I always tell firefighters, first and foremost, <clears throat> um, you call Mayday, right? This is uh, uh, Firefighter Smith to 
Chief Moore, or excuse me, uh, I, I'm I'm trapped. Right. I'm going low on air. Right. Mayday. Right. mayday. <clears throat> Regardless what the fire is, not necessarily based. Right. The next thing I'm going to tell you is, Chief, I converted my own harness. Okay. I undid my waist strap, and I put it between my legs. I will save, frighteningly, maybe two minutes, maybe a minute. Really great cruise, 45 seconds. But it'll be a while. I've seen guys take a long time. Converting. Oh, yeah. That conversion is brutal in low, in high heat, low, low visibility. And if oh, you're yeah. getting somebody out of a basement, you will curse yourself to the end of the time for not converting that. Because a lot of guys are like, this is too hard. Let's just go. Right. The guy will come out of the place naked. Right. The day comes off, coat comes off. Not that you want it to, but it just does. So I've been teaching for a while, guys. Go out. You call a mayday. You're talking to guys about maydays. Tell them they're low on air. They're in trouble. But they can reach. Convert your own harness. Another thing. We have a couple things. We have a Charlie or three-side report. We have an outside vent firefighter. You may have a chief officer. You right. may have half a crew. Whatever works to do that 360. Part of our 360 is a report of what the conditions are, the building dimensions. So it's two stories in the rear. It's three in the front, chief, just so you know. Right. right. That's a big deal for you. Yeah. And then I'm very anal about it. Is there a basement? Is the basement on fire? And is there access to access? Them? Yes, yes. Because you may be the first to see that. Now, a 15 inch by 60 inch, five feet off the ground, we may use and stick a line in, but that's not access. Access I'm talking about is a Bilco door. It's an actual walk down. It's, it's a, an yeah, actual there. slider, yeah, yeah. right? It's on a grade, right? right? That's what access is. But I want those every time. The other thing we do in Buffalo, New York, in our procedures, first do ladder company officer shall. So shall means you have to. Not maybe if I don't want to. Not if it didn't look like I needed to. No, right. shall. You have to. Um, shall check below grade for fire. Now, do you think that's because we're the brightest fire department in the world? <laughs> or is was it... It's downstairs, it's downstairs, get the foot back to line up, back to line up, back to line up. Because we did that enough times to go, you know what? Yeah, let's we miss it. these sometimes. Let's right. stop missing these. Right. You know, I always tell guys, we cheated. Guys always say to older guys, you know, it was amazing. You guys went to fires and you guys did stuff that was so different and blah, 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 blah. And I always go, well, you know, I always said, hey, that fire this morning when we were getting off went really well. What you didn't know is we were fortunate enough to have three fires that night. The first one sucked. The second one was better. And the third one, we were polished as hell. But some of that comes from just having the ability to do it again. Right? Not four weeks later because there's just not another fire. Right. Right. Yeah, that basement stuff is a big deal. Company chief or the truck company officer, it takes no time. Pop the door. Everything, by the way, Corley in Western New York. Everything has a basement. Everything does. Everything. No. Oh my God, yes. I okay. tell people, I tell people all the time, I'm blessed. I don't deal with balloon frame. I don't deal with basements. Like I I don't know what else. I have wind. That's what I have. So, and flying cars. Well, yeah, sometimes. Flying cows and flying cars. Flying cars, sometimes flying houses. But yeah. uh, now here's the deal. I don't I I'll be honest with you. I, I've interviewed a lot of people, Chief, and, I, and I'm proud of it and I'm humbled by it. But I do not often get a 45-year veteran of the fire service to come on here to, to interview. So I want to ask you this question, and and um, it's not one that was really planned, but I wanted to throw it at you, and it's what in your 45 years has been uh, – and you're still going strong. That's the thing. It's not like you're you, – you, it's not like, not, not like this is all in the rear view. You're still going strong. What's been the biggest change you have been surprised by – Throughout the decades. Well, so negative me. <laughs> okay. I will. Uh, so when I got on, 
I don't know if it was a year after I got out, we got Scott 4.5s. Okay. They were 19 pounds. Okay. Okay. 19 pounds. They were amazing because we had the old steel tank with the elephant trunk, right? Right. Yeah. No. Yeah. The regulator on the chest. Yeah. And they were like 19 pounds. I guess the surprise for me 45 years later, I thought. 45 years ago that by now I'd have a little thing like from fucking Star Trek. I'd put in my mouth and have all the air I ever wanted. Right. Who knew today the SCBAs at my firehouse weigh 37 pounds. Is anybody beyond me flabbergasted? Right. No, 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 that's beautiful. That's beautiful. But the other thing too is, uh, and again, I came from a poor place, meaning fire department wise. That's fair. That's fair. But the other biggie was uh, gotten a little out of control, um, but still a great thing was radios. When I got on, company officer had one. That's and it. Had nobody to fucking talk to. They were like talking right. to themselves, you know. <laughs> I was on a truck. We would split in two, and I guess I could write him a letter, you know. But we didn't have a radio. I mean, the guy, I used to go, and it wasn't like technology wasn't there. I'd go to the mall, and, like, there'd be three janitors all converging on where a kid threw up. You know, Tom, someone threw up in front of Jen's. Okay, Bill, I'm on my way to the bucket. Okay, I got the map. And I'm going to fucking fires where people's lives are at stake. No, we don't have any. (laughs) So radios have been good. We do have to watch because we have so many now people just want to talk, and that's always an issue, too. But, um Radio is probably on a positive side, along with thermal imagers. Both are pretty advanced things in reality of what they can do. What always bothered me, we used to have four channels. Now we have 500, and I don't know if we got any better. You know what I mean? Last little thing on basements, I want to say. Go, go. So another SOP <clears throat> I wrote for Christiana was our basement fires, the pump operator, the first two. So, Step back, not basement fires. We go to a fire, right? Two and a half story frame. Looks like it's on the second floor, right? First two engine gets, they stretch a line. Pump operator gets some water to the line and gets their feed set up. And the next thing the pump operator does on that engine is take a folding attic ladder, put it at the front door. Not when it's a basement fire, every fire. Every fire. Because you won't be in trouble at the fire that you knew was a basement. It'll be the right. one that surprised you. There was one line of duty death. Guy made 17 calls on the radio. <clears throat> hey, if you just slide a ladder down here, I think I can get out. Hey, just drop a ladder in here. Most people never heard them. That's the only thing about radios. So many people have them, you know. Fred, did you bring the dog in the canteen? You know, right? Just, you know, Chief, where do you want us to park the ambulance? Out of the fucking way. I don't know, but not, yeah. not that you should be <laughs> calling me on the radio um, to ask. Me. Thank you for that. Yes. But, and all I'm saying is, but yeah, this guy, you know, we have our pump operator put that folding ladder for the, he felt the floor opens up. Maybe we can get him. Right. But right. Time does matter. No, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And no, I, making it a procedure takes away that, oh, it didn't look like a basement fire. Yeah, that's the one that will come and bite us. Right. If it looks like a basement fire, you're prepped for it, right? Exactly, exactly. Yes, I love it. I absolutely love it, Chief. Um, and I don't anything you want to bring, please let me know because I'm just throwing stuff at you right now. I wanted to ask you about the 45 years, what surprised you. And I also asked you, at, um, after 45 years, still going strong, of course, what things have we lost along the way? Like, what surprised you, but what have we lost along the way that we need to bring back? It, so I look back now and then, and uh, I, this is tough. It, by no means is it everywhere. Sure. I don't know. I'll really get in trouble. I, 
No, and, and I see guys in pretty big, pretty good fire department. Okay, in the fire service, and then you, I'm going to be crucified, but um, and primarily because of EMS. You know, people always said to me, "Did you always want to become a fireman because of emergency?" I go. No, when emergency came out, I was like, oh, maybe I don't want to be a fireman. I don't want to do all that medical stuff. Right. <laughs> no, I just want to go to fires. Yes. And fortunately, in Buffalo, we went to fires. We didn't, you know, like, here's a Band-Aid. Uh, oh, you lost your arm. I'm sorry. Well, here's a bigger Band-Aid. <laughs> you right. Know, exactly. Johnny and Roy, you know. But um, uh, so, so, but I do see in defense of those guys i'm not saying by any stretch ems is wrong or anything like that but what i am saying is way beyond the fire service too it's broken there are places doing eight nine ten thousand runs for an ambulance a year yes it's on insane. bullshit and it's i mean my son's a paramedic and like we always talk about this call and that call one of his best was he gets called they go the guy goes, he go, you know, what's the matter? And he goes, I got sleep in my eyes. You know, like the little. Yes. <laughs> you know what yes. I mean? And, it's and like, we, you, yes. No, it's okay to say it's bullshit. Oh, my God. And another guy calls and, and they're not outliers anymore. No, it is. They're, it, they're the reality. <sighs> you get me fired up, Chief. Well, the point is, is that, and it's broken beyond that. So yes. the city of Toronto is a separate third service, right? Okay. Uh, medics and city of toronto is big a lot of people don't realize if it was in the u.s it'd be the second biggest city in the united states right on four million people in a relatively small area pretty absolutely big. and uh their issue is wait times and their record was like 22 hours like three crews switch crews at the hospital st standing next to a stretcher three entire crews worked your whole day standing next to a stretcher Worked your whole day, stand next to the stretcher. Worked almost your whole day. It's insane. Yeah. And the thing is, it's way beyond us because it's broken. Like, the nursing home can't get a bed. So the hospital ICU can't get a bed. So the ER can't get a bed. So you can't get them off your stretcher. And it's, it's a real, real... I mean, it's not little and it's not pretend. And then, like you say, the BS. No. You know, it's... Yes. It's it's a big deal. It is and a complete I, loss of mission focus. A com like, I'm there for you. If you need me to make your heart beat by doing this, I'm there for you. I am. I am. But I am not there for your toothache. And that is not the reason I signed up for this job. And it's okay to say that. But we need people to beat the drum. So anyway, sorry, Chief. You got no. me fired up. You, you got <laughs> me going. What does come with 45 years is a wonderful pension. <laughs> the fire department's been good to me. Yes. And the a certain amount of uh, I really don't care. So this year, we had a horrendous winter in a little bit. Um, Western New York's real funny. We have what's called lake effect snow. You might have heard of it. But we had, I live above Niagara Falls. All right. Now, in the Stammers, where I still am a volley, they had 80 inches of snow, 8-0, um, and 70-mile-an-hour winds for three days. We had 48 people killed in the blizzard, mm. frozen death in their cars, horrendous. So I'm there. I'm this old man. I'm, we're trying to push our rigs out. Our rigs are getting stuck. So we go on this one run. So we get there, and this guy has like uh, – so, oh, I got strep throat. And I go, call fucking Tuesday. You know, I'm like, I really, he goes, are, are you going to get a stretcher? I go, nope, you're going to walk, maybe to the hospital. Because <laughs> I don't know if we can get out. Right. Jesus, it's like, it's a disaster. Stay home. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, unfortunately, like I always say, we need a concerted effort, hospitals, doctors, EMS. But the problem is, what happens when you call a doctor? What's the first thing that they say the machine says? Oh, yeah. If you are having an emergency, call 911. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's it. 
every time. And it almost becomes if anything doesn't go well with this phone call, call, call 911. That's it. Dude, you just nailed it. And and all I'm saying is I see people leaving the fire service because routinely, you know, I just can't do this the rest of my life. And it's tough. And and I just I don't know where it goes. I really mean that. I just no. don't know where it goes. No, no, you be no, no, you you are spot on. And the and I think the only antidote I can throw out there, and, and the one I want to I will I will do this on the scrap each and every episode is Get fire focused. That's why we exist. That's why it says fire department. Like, I don't want to say, I don't want to say this the wrong way. Um, I'm here when people have medical emergencies. Fuck EMS. So, well, the other thing is, someone else can do something. Like in Buffalo, an EMS call comes out. There's a private ambulance. I mean, we go too. But if yes. there's a fire going, we have a step down program. If we have a multiple high enough or more than one fire, we stop going to EMS calls other than cardiac arrests. Yes. And you know what? The rest of them don't miss us. Right. <laughs> I don't mean. I know I sound like an asshole. People are like, No, you're not an asshole. You're not a. Me. You're not an. That's the problem. Is you're not. It's the truth. It's the truth, and people need to hear it. So anyway, yeah. F taxi rides. Thank you. Um, all right, sorry, man. Chief, you got me fired up. I can't believe you got me fired. This fired up. This I blame I blame Mike Lombardo. 100 percent That's like a drug. Yes. It's like a drug. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I always love to ask uh my guests if there is a book that peop uh you think firefighters should be reading or book or books. Not I want to limit you to one. So I still like some of those uh uh, almost all those Leo Stapleton books. Remember Leo Ooh. Stapleton from Boston? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Boston. Yes. Well, his books weren't tactical books, but really were. Like they were quote unquote novels. Right. But they really had tremendous messages and in a sort of entertaining way. Yes. There's a lot of, I mean, it's so hard to pick on stuff. Mike Champo just wrote a great book on tower ladders, um, did a great job. It's it. I don't know how you pick one. I haven't written a book. I don't plan to. My only thing, I have a thing called the Fire Archive. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Um, I'll send you a link to it when we're done. No, absolutely. But I worked for a couple of guys, Jack and Harvey Supple. So to step back a little, my dad died when I was two years old. Okay. I come from a long line of very short living people. Uh, my brother was 57. My mother was 60. My sister was 61. You know, no one lives long. I'm on borrowed time. I don't know if we'll make it through the interview, but um, before I die. But um, uh, <laughs> and, um, I was the kid who hung around the firehouse. Right. So Harvey Supple was a brand new battalion chief that came up to the seventh battalion. He was there for like a year. And he said, Oh, come on down to the third, real busy battalion, right? Buffalo, the third battalion. So I went down. I used to take the bus down. I was 11 years old. I took the bus. Wow. The neighborhood. Right. I'd, I'd ride and I'd ride till like 1130. The last bus was at midnight. I'd take their bus home, you know, people thought I was crazy and maybe right. But, um, but then I went in the military. I rode with Harvey for a long time. I went in the military. He wrote me every week. Here's what's going on, blah, blah, blah. And I took the test. He ended up my first battalion chief and his brother, Jack was my first division chief, uh, citywide tour commander. And uh, they were, I know they're both passed away. Harvey died a number of years ago, not too, too long after retiring. Mm -hmm. But Jack um, uh, died uh, two years ago, December 7th, 19, um, or excuse me, uh, 2022. Mm. Um, 2021, excuse me, Jack died. And uh, they, uh, were I mean more than mentors, probably the closest thing I had to a father. But they were also big buffs. They went to New yes. York all the time. Our, uh, Jack and Harvey both took pictures also in Buffalo when they were off duty. So I've been, um, I've been converting all these slides to uh, electronics, and uh, I put them on this Facebook page, the Fire Archive, and nice. like I have like 1926 water tower that they have 
in action in New York City. Um, you know, there's so much stuff that's so tremendous that I don't think people realize it's tremendous. Like right, right. Super pumper pumping at a fire. New York's Tower Ladder 1, the first tower ladder ever at a fire, right? I mean, it's just amazing stuff. And they had like probably 50,000 slides. So I'll be doing this for a while. <laughs> <laughs> but it's pretty neat. And No, that's awesome. You know, I put up two today. One is two guys, black rubber coats, no stripes, tin helmets, going in a top floor window. And it's ugly. And they're going to like hold their breath a little bit, you know, and try and get their nose on the floor. You know, I said about crawling, you know, what is the skill? Right. You know, I I sit, I see guys, it was really hot. We had to back out. You know, it's amazing. But two feet lower, it really was survivable. Right, right. Honestly. It's no, that's amazing, awesome. You know? And, and how, do you, how do you translate that to people who, who don't experience it? So I go back all the way to the beginning when we were talking about training. We have to take that back. Yes. So we have to have people go into a fire or into a training burn and go, fuck, that was hot. Yes. Good. You know, Good. You know where you can survive, right? FDTN, we pride ourselves on that. I mean, I always say, have you been to the National Fire Academy? Have you? No, no, no. Me personally, no. The National Fire Academy, they have a subway station mock-up, they have a ship, they have a 747, they have a uh, row of stores with apartments above the burns, okay. they have a 10-story burn building, but the travel's forever, because it's in England. We don't have anything at our National Fire Academy. We just <laughs> I wondered if you were going there, but I loved it. I loved it. Thank just you. just do a class that we could put over the fucking internet now. We don't even need to go anywhere. Right on. So, England's National Fire Academy has pretty advanced shit. I'm just saying we almost like that's a disdain, like we're above that. Oh. No, 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 no. But I want to I want to bring something up with you, Mike, right now, which is you got a shirt on right now that says FDTN. I love, love, love Jim McCormick. Uh I've never been to his his oh, facility. You gotta come. I know, I know. I but I want you to talk about uh just briefly what I, I wish I could yeah, I gotta. I got them within arm's reach, man, right here. Like, hey, well, make some fires. Who wrote that? Oh, yeah, maybe somebody. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. So the network started, I think, in 1998. They started out with one container. Jimmy was on my team at FDIC. That's how I met him. And really? Our burn program is still what we used to do. We're anal about stuff. When we right. light a fire, it's... We're lighting, we're lighting, we're light. We check every company, engine one, engine two, ladder one, ladder two, or whatever we're doing. Okay, we're lighting, we're lighting, we're lighting. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And it may sound simple, but I, one guy was doing, we had a guy come to help, and he's going, fire in the hole. I go, don't say that. Oh, why? <laughs> you, you know what that, I go, I know exactly what it means, but I don't want, that's not what we say here. Right. And we have a lot of those things. People would probably hate us, but we have a lot of those things. But we have, I think we're up to 15 prop buildings, one six stories tall. Um, we have basement fires. We have hoarder fires. We have um, search operations. And we do a number of different classes. Like just to illustrate, we do a fire camp in the spring and the fall. Right. So three days. Uh, six sections, right? Half day, half day, half day, half day. It's all skills and it's forcible entry, search, basements, quarters, writ, and survival. Love it. And you go through those. Wow. Then a different class, we usually run the same way once in the spring, once in the fall. This year, I think we're running a couple in the fall. Is combat, it's called. So that one, you come for four days and it's half day each, but you're either on an engine or a truck and you'll go on 105 responses. They're just like responses at home and 35 to 37 good working fires. Mm. We have car accidents, the whole thing. Wow. The classroom. And the thing is, um, 
we have people, it almost becomes humorous. We have one run, guys come, it's 10 East Lane, right? They come, there's street signs, the whole thing in the place, right? And these guys come and they're putting ladders up and guys got ready to feed. Yes, I go, what are you doing? Well, you know, this is what you want us to do, right? I go, this place on fire? And they go, well, no, but we we thought you wanted us to do that. I go, would you do that at home? And I go, no. And I go, then go investigate. It's a false alarm. <laughs> Don't you have those? And they're absolutely shocked. The first one, they go, oh, we thought everything would be a fire. No, you wouldn't make it if everything was a fire. Right. Because most don't make the 37. Right. A lot are like, we're done. <laughs> you know? Love it. And it's it's just an interesting thing. We have a rescue company school. We have uh, uh, one class on designing, building, and operating container-based props. We have uh, one is... Uh, just fire training, it's called, and it's how to operate within a fire environment with students, how to watch them, how to take care of them. Wow. You know, we work a lot on realistic stuff, like in the combat class. Right. So if I'm watching the fire with a line, right, because we still have a safety line watching the fire. But if you came searching, you know, I'll say, this is engine six, we got this corner, but I heard somebody calling for help towards the front. Okay. And they don't know any better, you know. We do a lot of things like if you've ever seen the containers, we'll have containers like a T, but where they meet, we put marine grade plywood, a couple feet each side bent over the seam. One, you don't tear your gear up, but two, you don't know where you are. You don't know you went from one container. to Wow. No, that makes Little sense. Stuff. You know, one of my favorite things in, in, and I know you're in Oklahoma, so I'll be, my house will be bombed, but. <laughs> One of my favorite things in IFSTA is how do you show a room's been searched? Do you know the latest? The latest yeah. IFSTA. The latest IFSTA book, the way you show a room searched is you close the door. Okay. I was going to say, like, there was a time when it was pulled a mattress in half. and, and Oh, but... so we'll get to that. So, okay. <laughs> it's all right. close the door. so I always said, you're my captain. I'm new. Been to some runs, but I'm going to a fire tonight. You and I are on our way, mutual aid. It's a three-story apartment house. It's a real weird place, center hall, stairs in the middle. Mike, I know this place. Chief needs to search second floor. There's four rooms on each side of the stairs when we get up there. Right. Okay. Mike, you're going to take the ones on the right. I'll take the ones on the left. I'm only that far away. Don't worry. Okay, Cap, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Um. So up we go. And 30 seconds later, you're searching room and I'm back. Mike, did you get the other rooms? No, someone must have already got them. The doors were shut. So my point I bring up is <laughs> that, like, did we explain that? So then what did it used to be? The last one, carry your chalk. Remember, get your chalk out of your fucking pocket, right? Corley, <laughs> I searched this room. you want to get a beer after work. If right. you can read a note I write on the fucking door, what do we not have to do? Search. Right. Perfectly clear. Get your po chalk out of your pocket. Stop. I mean, just stop. It's just nonsense. Used to be, turn the mattress in a U. I have a California <laughs> king. You're a big, strong guy. But come on over. That'll launch you into next week. <laughs> if you do get the U. If I get sad, oh. give, give, me three, give me three firefighters so I can show this room has been searched. Yeah, it's just and, right. and there's so many things. And I know I'm a negative guy. I apologize. But there's so many things that we just are taught as a matter of fact, that right. just I was taught that. That just no, no, like, no, me too, me too. When I came on, you know, I was always told, put your hand on the wall, swing the tool. I do just the opposite. I put the tool on the wall because I'm sick of finding something with the handle of the axe, putting it down, putting my hand over, going, what is that? Right. So I right. search with my hand. I get just as much reach, but I'm searching with my hand instead of the tool. I'll put and you can feel it. It's just little stuff. But yeah, so FDTN, pretty good place. Um, <laughs> I think we're we're doing thousands every year now of people through. Um, a thousand to between one and two thousand people each year. So it's a pretty good place. I think we're the I call it the real National Fire Academy. It is the National Fire Academy. It is the uh, man, I think that is the proper term for it people call it the disneyland for firefighters who love it it, it is it is yeah 
That is it, man. I, I'm going to come someday and do at least the battalion chiefs thing because I don't want to take somebody's spot that needs to be crawling around and smoke and stuff, but I, I want to do it. Um, and I know Jim, I could call Jim and, and say, hey, I really want to come. But anyway, not the point. Um, it is Disneyland for firefighters. Uh, well, all we, that being said, go well, ahead. We need more like it. Yes, yes. What I mean no, is that needs to be our fire that instead of being a sarcastic, that's our national fire academy. That needs to be our fire academy. So the thing is, too, is one of the things that people come back to me on is, yeah, but every county has one or every state has one. Blah, blah, blah. I go, listen, there are guys in this country that would have to go 500 miles to get a live burn facility that's decent. Yes. You know, really. And people, the East Coast is a little bit spoiled. Well, that we built another one in the south half of the county because we had to drive 15 minutes. So, yeah. you know what I mean? They have, but I, I go, a lot of places are not like that. They have a lot of uh, traveling to do to get anything. Yes. And also, it should be advanced enough. I mean, I would think certainly after 9 11, it, we would see the need for that. You, I, know, you would think, you would think. Teaks, great place, Teaks. But again, that's the fire service, you know? That's yes. the fire service. So, I all think right. I'm going to send out a challenge to everybody still watching. Dude, you, this has been one of the most amazing, like, steady audience participation things. So, I'm sending it out Facebook versus YouTube. Uh, just shout out where you're at and um, whether you love Mike Lombardo or. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I wouldn't even ever say that. But here's the thing, Chief. We have a thing we do on the weekly scrap, and it, it's it's been since the very beginning. And it's called the Five Questions for Firefighters, and okay. then we we I asked them for about a hundred episodes, and then pretty much everybody had answered everything about the five questions. So we changed it up. It became the next five questions, and then after another hundred episodes or so, we we have the five questions versions three point or the five Q three, so to speak. Basically, there's no wrong answers. It's just your opinion. And so what I want to know is I pass out the points. The audience helps me. There's no right answers. It's just your opinion. And so are you ready for the next, next five questions for firefighters? I'm ready. Let's do this. Okay. We kind of touched on the, this one earlier because we, we kind of just touched on it. Uh, what is the skill that has carried you through your fire service career single skill and i think i mentioned it already you did we mentioned we kind of oh. we kind of glossed over it but I, I wanted to throw it at you so go ahead crawl and everybody thinks i'm crazy oh if i can see my feet i can blah, blah, blah. i never found a victim standing up and you know what i've seen too many people missed over my career all over the place read about them saw them the board up people finding them the fire marshals finding them whatever and there's a place where for your safety and for finding people more is or as importantly obviously your safety is important but just as important as finding people and like i said the ultimate example is i see guys go in a bedroom and sort of gloss over a bed you'll miss you can miss a family in a king size bed you know what i mean if you're on the floor and just reaching so yeah as simple as it is crawl Crawl. Turn your there light on too. Say, turn your light on. Off. Off. Everybody talks about head uh, lights. They're great in real heavy smoke. Turn them off. You'll see a lot better. All you do when you turn it on is you get a ball of light in front of you. This is what I love, man. Chief Mike Lombard, like Chief, before today. In fact, this morning we never talked before, right? Right. That's fair. No, I never talked to you before. I love the conversation we had this morning. I love the conversation we're having today. I got to see you speak a couple of years ago. And what I've noticed is you are the guy who stands up and says, hey, what about this? I love it, man. I absolutely love it. It challenges my own thinking. And it's it's fantastic. And so absolutely max points on crawl and the people are agreeing with it. Reflection, great answer. Never thought of it that way. Mike, yes, absolutely. Mad respect for Chief Lombardo. That's the comments coming in. I absolutely love it. And that's the max points on number one. Number two, 
By the way, last week was the first time we did the five questions number three, version 3.0. So this week, you are the second person ever to do the five questions, version 3.0. Number two, what is the most important, and I put it in quotation marks, soft skill to possess in a leadership position? You got to do everything your guys will do. Say it Uh, again. You got to do everything your guys will do. I never, ever, Mm. ever asked anybody to do something I wouldn't do. I always led from the front. Mm. Um, To include all the way to when I was the fire chief, I'd sneak out to a rookie class. And all of a sudden, I'd come up behind them quietly at the end of the day doing push-ups with them. And... They go, do you see who's behind you? The instructors. And I'm like, you're fine. You're fine. Just keep going. Right. But it does matter. And um, I always said, you know, my job is to focus on the next emergency. People say, well, you're the fire chief now. You don't go to the next emergency. I go, you're absolutely right. I don't. I go to multiple alarms. But that's it. I go, but the difference is I'm still focused on the next emergency because that's how I put the budget together. That's how we do staffing. That's how we do um, our capital um, purchase program. You know, there's many things we're doing. And to do them right, you focus on the next one. Wow. And stop with the nonsense. Because there's a lot of nonsense we can focus on. Focus on the next run. Right? So I could get in trouble with that one too, but we won't. I, I, I'm just I, I'm watching chat right now, and the sheer number of max points going by just completely reinforces my own heart and soul when I say this is the easiest in two hundred. Yeah, your <laughs> max dot freaking dot points. Uh, this is the easiest max points I have given out in two hundred and two episodes, brother. Thank you for that answer. Max points for number two. Uh, Question three. What is your favorite fire service tradition? So, I I, I don't know if it's fire service, meaning the official side of it. But I still, and I lived that way when I was in a company, I still love to come to more Oklahoma and stop at the firehouse. Ooh, I love it. And hi guys, how are you? And could you show me around and shoot the shit, whatever, have a cup of coffee. And I've done that in Venice, Italy, and I've done it in, you know, Reykjavik, Iceland, and I've done it all over the United States. You know, I always tell people teaching, I learn more than any of they do. Right. Now, I do a class, but I'm talking to somebody about this, that, and the other thing, and it's spectacular. You know, I've learned so much in my career, quote unquote, teaching, because I just was exposed to so many people in so many different places, you know, and there is more than one right way to do what we do. Right. But yeah, that tradition of brother or sisterhood that we can. You know, pretty much, I always used to kid, I was talking to a guy from New Zealand who was riding with us once in Buffalo. And I, that's about as far on the planet as you can get. And all kinds of things, they worked the exact same schedule we did. Two days, two nights, off four. In the furthest point in the earth, right? Right, right. And I said, you know, someday a thousand years from now, there'll be some fire, firefighter from Alpha Centauri who are land and go beep, beep, you know, and then they'll be like doing the exact same shit we did, you know? What do you want to eat for lunch? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I just, that, that, I don't know that that's an official part of the fire service, but just that, that we are open and, and everyone's not that. Cops don't do that. You know, doctors and nurses don't do that. You know, my wife's a nurse. She never said, let's go visit that hospital on vacation. But I yeah. go stop at a firehouse. Right, yeah. right. And I love that. I love that. The brother, I, I, I absolutely, I love the fact that you tied in aliens coming in from another planet and, and compared them to New Zealand. 
I'm not sure that's what you actually did, but that's what I'm saying you did. Uh, max points for number three. Easy max points. Um, great conversations tonight. Uh, never heard of this man before. That's part of what the scrap is giving to the fire service, a sense of history, tradition, and meaningful con- continuity through listening to these men. 100%, man. Uh, man, I love Chief Mike Lombardo. If you haven't heard from him or of him, man, 100%. Just welcome to just a whole lot of wisdom. Number four. I'm ready. Who are the four people you would put on your Mount Rushmore of the fire service. So mine might be a little bit different. I, um, I, I, I honestly, I would be surprised if it wasn't. <laughs> I'm happy about it. Let's see. Let's hear it. Um, so two would be people just to me. And that would be the two people I talked about earlier. Jack Supple and Harvey Supple. Doesn't mean mm-hmm. a thing to you, but. Um, I will tell you a real fast story. I apologize for running on like a go. Hey, I'm telling you right now, people are are wanting to hear you run on. So go. But um, I'm a captain of the rescue. Um, I was a firefighter there, got promoted, moved around, went to truck 11 for a bunch of years, came back to the rescue as captain. And I'm working one night. We have a new guy as lieutenant on the truck. There's an engine truck and rescue now. It's big house, 14 guys on the shift. So about 5.30, in this lieutenant on the truck, it's his very first night tour as a lieutenant. So earlier in the evening, he came in and sat the crew down, and these are my expectations. You know, they're pretty typical stuff everybody promoted does, right? So about 5 o'clock in the morning, very, very cold, maybe 5.30. Sun's just Britain, not even up, but a little rays of light. We get a box not far from the firehouse. So the truck with the officer, they're out the door in like a split second, right? Let's go, you know. <laughs> All right, right. Um, I'm not going to be late. So um, they go out the door. We're behind them, but we're a little bit. The engine's behind us. And the truck pulls up on location, winds low, two and a half story frame, heavy fire conditions throughout, transmit wow. a second. So there's no exposures. There's a field next to it field next to it, field behind it, street. Okay. So we we pull up, and as we pull up, the uh, lieutenant runs up and goes, cap, cap, cap. We didn't need a second alarm, did we? They go, well. And as I say, well, this whole place goes, whoosh. Now it's an eight-foot pile of rubbish. (laughs) Right? And he goes, fuck, now we definitely don't need a second alarm. (laughs) But the engine's laying a couple of big lines going to the hydrant. So the division chief, who's Jack Supple, gets there, and he goes to the lieutenant, he goes, Lou, he goes, second alarms are cheap in Buffalo. What he meant by that was we can send that extra alarm, and it's not like the city is threatened, you know? Right, right. He goes, it's okay. And he gives every company on the second alarm a little job and then says, go home. But it's like, you know, engine 37, give 33 a hand, pack in that five inch, then you can take up. Okay, chief. And he does that with everybody. Now he could have gone, we didn't need a second alarm here and destroyed this guy. But instead he gave everybody a little order that nobody's the wiser. And this guy, he built him up instead of ever doing that. Mm. That's leadership. Anybody could go, I, we didn't need this. What the, what are you doing? You know, and not at all. And he fortified this guy instead of making him like, a nervous rack, you know, and I just thought that was amazing. The other two names you may not know is one is Bill Clark. Um, Is that Willie Clark or just? Bill Clark was uh, from New York City and he went to Prince George's County, went to Florida, he went to Wisconsin and he went all over the country. He retired in, uh, from New York in like 48 or something. Okay. I mean, we're going way back. Yeah. He uh, wrote a couple of books, tremendous stuff. Um, I, I love William Clark's Blue Book. I mean, that's that's one of my go-tos. But One of the things he did, so one of the things he did that I always thought was pretty amazing was uh, up in Wisconsin, he ran the fire programs for the state, 
They did three municipalities, about the same size, same population, same demographic, same um, geography. One, they did heavy fire inspections. One, they did heavy fire prevention. Ooh. One, they did nothing. What do you think the outcome was? And they did it a year. Really? The, the fire prevention or the fire inspections was the best. Doing nothing was second, and trailing a ways down was fire prevention. Oh, wow. I thought it was fascinating. No, that is. They that talked is. about, like, I always relate it to, you know, DARE, the police, the DARE, don't do drugs, whatever it is, but, you know, the DARE programs. Right. You know that? My son, I remember when he was a little kid, like fourth or fifth grade, he goes, you know, these cops came in and said, you guys know about this, and you guys know about this. He goes, None of us knew anything about that, you know, but they just said we did, you know. Right. And it's a little bit fire prevention. You know, we used to kid that it was fire extension week. Oh, we didn't think about fires until this week, you know, and then we'd have all kinds of fires after that. <laughs> but Bill Clark did that. The other thing that was pretty, neat, I was in a fire, uh, I was at a Christmas party at Fire Engineer. Many Love it. Years ago, and Bill Clark was there. And I'm talking to him, and I am like in awe. Like, this guy is like, you know, something else. So we're talking, and the discussion turns to Gettysburg. And I go, yeah, I was at Gettysburg with my son a couple of uh, months ago. He goes, oh, yeah, my dad was at the Battle of Gettysburg. Oh, wow. So I'm like, I thought he said his dad was at the Battle of Gettysburg. Like, I said to a friend, I go, that, I couldn't have heard that right. Right. This is 1999, you know, like, whatever. And that was in 1863. Right. <laughs> Turns out his father was a drummer boy. He was 10 years old. Wow. He had Bill Clark late. This is fucking the Battle of Gettysburg. Right. Once removed. That's amazing. So he's, nope. on, he's on the wall. Um, and yeah. then the other one you probably never heard of. Okay. I named Emanuel Freed. And he wrote a couple books too. And he was a guy from New York and uh, he was on the speaking circuit. You know, these guys, Elmer Chapman, Bill Clark, Emmanuel Freed, they didn't tell jokes. They weren't like bozos like me. They really knew what the hell they were talking about. Elmer Chapman knew more about systems in high rise building than anybody alive. Right. Wow. And they were amazing guys. Um, but you never heard of them. Because they weren't really entertaining, <laughs> you know. Right. No, it was but, uh, information. Information. Yes, dumped. yes. But Emmanuel Freed, what was really was coming to uh, Buffalo to uh, do a class, and he had a heart attack. And I ended up picking his daughter up at the airport, dropping her off. She was a cardiologist. Okay. And, uh, um, I visited him, brought him stuff, took care of him, took him to the airport. So we became, you know, a friendship. Sure. Um, until he passed away. But those are my four. They mean nothing to anybody. <laughs> hmm. <So. laughs> I'd say, I'd say, I, I, I don't know about the, 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 the two brothers early. The supple, was it supples? Supple. Yes. Yeah. I don't know them early, but I know Clark and I know Freed. And so I oh, absolutely, good. absolutely, man, this <laughs> Timothy was said, this guy is fantastic. Thank you for approving. And I agree. Max points for your Mount Rushmore of the fire service, without a doubt, brother. That that was a. I love stories. A B the the everybody in the chat loves stories, so it's just phenomenal. And this is my favorite question. I've got to ask this two hundred and one times, and this is number two hundred and two. There is heavy fire. There is searchable space. Would you rather be assigned to the nozzle? Or first in on VES. Oh, the VES, no doubt. Instant. Any, any pussy can squirt water in a fire. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Those guys on the engine, I think they're important. I'm not 100 percent sure, but I think they are. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. No, but I would, I would take that any day. And, and you know, I always said that, you know, it wasn't every day. You'd do searches, and it'd be like walking around in smoke, right? A right. Lot of but every now and then, right? And I was in a pretty busy place. We went to a lot sure. of fun. Sure. But every now and then you went in a place and you came out, your fucking helmet was actually drooping and you were like, fuck. 
Yeah. And that was worthwhile. And I always, you know, we had a run one day on Townsend Street. I was in a ladder company, Ladder 11. I was there 13 years. It was the greatest place I ever spent in my career. And it was very weird night. We had six guys. We never had six guys. We had six guys. Right. We go on Townsend Street. It's two streets behind the firehouse. Our firehouse doesn't have an engine. It's just us and the chief. Right? So we pull out. We get there right away. And we have no water. We have water cans. Right? So mom and dad are hysterical. It's a big two and a half frame. And every window on the first floor, except for the back window on the CD corner on the D side, has fire roaring out of it. Roaring, yes. And that window has what looks like a lo locomotive trapped in it, smoke belching just, out. Just chugging. So three of us, um, my irons guy, can guy, and myself, go in the window. And these people are hysterical. There are kids in there. And we go in the window, and my driver, Tommy Spelzinger, is smart. He throws another cannon. Chuck had a can, and then we had another can because it was like no engine, right? Right. So it turns out we're in a bathroom, a little bathroom. The tub surround is in the tub. It's that hot. Right. And the cabinet's off the wall. We're moving, inching forward. When you go out the bathroom door, there's like a two-foot tiny little hallway. You make a left, you make a right, and there's the kitchen. And the front of the kitchen's all fire, and everything past it all the way to the front of the building's all fire. Right. So off the kitchen, this is a hundred year old place. Off the kitchen is a bedroom. And we start into the bedroom. Um, Chuck's got the can. He's trying to keep it back. TJ and our guy, my crew, he checks and he finds a bed with the bed real low to the floor. What are we looking at? Bunk beds, right? You find a bed low to the floor, always throw your hands up, right? So sure enough, it's bunk beds. Sure enough, it's never that easy. There's no kid. Right. So he drops both of them, right? He gets to a closet, and in a pile of clothes, underneath the pile of clothes, is a two-year-old. So he goes, I'm at the door. He goes, Cap, I'm going out the window. I go, okay. He goes, nope, I'm not going out the window. So they have bars on the window on the outside. One of my guys was working on him, but he hadn't got him yet. Right. So he passes the kid to me. I take him out. We go back. Chuck and him are both using the can, the two cans to try and hold the fire back. I hand them to my driver. My driver runs with a cop, jumps in a police car, and they take this kid in cardiac arrest to the hospital. So good sized city. That's the last we hear. I mean, it's right. not like you find out much, you know. Right. So we figure, man, well, that's sad, you know. But so about a month later, we're sitting in the firehouse. Here comes mom, dad, with the two year old walking between them, holding their hands got a big bubble on his head where he was burned and he's fine and i said fuck that hose i mean anybody can do that this is unbelievable and you can't there's nothing i don't think on earth that replaces that at least to me so but that was one of those real hot searches you know you know what the toughest search of all is right i really mean it let me hear it no one's there. Yeah. Oh, it's a bitch. No. no people are saying, you're certain. I must have missed somebody. Let me go again. I must have missed somebody. Let me go again. Mm. Nobody there is tough. No. It's like the uh, none of the above on the multiple choice. Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. You're fucking with me. <laughs> yeah. 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 Dude, brother. Hey, this. Holy shit. This might be the easiest max points I've ever given. Um. Five for five. If anybody disagrees, let me know and I'll fight you in the chat. Uh, five for five. Max points from Mike Lombardo. Uh, my brother. That officially makes it 202 scraps in the books. Yeah, the, the chat's just rolling by. I can't even read everything. Uh brother, had a wonderful time. I tremendously appreciate the offer. Thank you. Oh, brother, if people want to get a hold of you, how do they do it? Um... I'm on Facebook. Uh, just Michael Lombardo. No, Mike Lombardo. And the other way would be uh, the Fire Archive. And it's on Facebook. It's the Fire Archive. Nice. 
and uh, either of those would get to me. And my, I'll give you my email too. Um, it's BFD Boss, obnoxious, right? BFD Boss at gmail.com. B like Fire, Buffalo, like Buffalo Fire Department. BFD okay. Boss. BFD Boss at, at gmail.com. There you go. There you go. Another excellent scrap. Max points the whole way through. 12 of 10 would scrap again. Highly recommend. Great scrap. Can't wait to watch the whole thing. Am loving this man. That comes from Carpe Fuego. Uh, the guests keep getting better and better. Can't wait for next scrap. Was it Fire Archives? It was The Fire Archives on Facebook. Outstanding scrap. Max points. Fact. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Chief, man. Thanks hey. for having me, Corley. Thank you for sharing your evening with me. Now, one thing I want to share to you, and this is always, I put somebody on the spot right here at the end, but when this ends, I'm getting ready to end it, is I'm going to I'm gonna do my, my outtake, but for like the next 10, 15, 20 minutes, we hang out, and the vigilante is going to come here and tell you how you did and talk to you about your... Oh, your, okay. Yeah, it, you're invited to it. It's optional, but I always like to put people on the spot and ask them. I meant to ask you earlier, but of, of course I forgot. <laughs> uh, everybody else... Tonight was amazing. Thank you. This is the first time we ever streamed live to Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And there's so many freaking comments. It's been awesome. So please, please, please let us know what was cool and what was not so we can make it better. The Vigilante After Party starts in a few minutes. Um, guests that are coming up. Let me shout them out. I don't even have the, I don't even have the guest list up. Give me two seconds. Do not judge me. There we go. I'm not leaving, but I have to run. I have a prostate the size of your head. Do what you got to do. I'll be back in a few minutes. You Do it, brother. Next week, DJ Stone, Charlie Dahl, Jeremy Sanders, Eric Sailors. We'll be here, brother. Come on back. Uh, Jason Hobbleman, Clay McGee, Jeff Rothmeyer, Brian Richards. The scraps are looking phenomenal moving forward. And the coolest part is, thanks to Sam, everybody gives, if you if you haven't, please throw up rocker horns or whatever you can do. I'm not even sure what you can do with the new chat options, but we're going to find out because tonight was the first night. But throw up rocker horns or whatever you can do for Sam because he is the one that absolutely is the background making this stuff happen. And throwing up the pictures, taking care of the guests, taking care of me, making the scrap happen. So do that. And back to my notes so I can finish strong. If you're not a vigilante, A, I'm sorry. You're missing out. Um, there is so much cool stuff going on, including the after party that's about to happen. Everybody in the vigilantes, I'll be posting the scrap link in just a few short minutes so you can join in and we can talk to Chief Mike Lombardo for a few minutes. Uh, I already told you everybody's coming up. Vigilantes are awesome. There is a... Uh, Killing with competence hoodie slash t-shirt thing coming out soon tonight, supposedly, but I doubt it's actually going to happen because I had too much fun talking to, to, to Mike, honestly, I'll be honest with you. So it's probably not going to happen. So here we go. Um, everybody out there, audience, you are the ones that make the scrap magical because your questions make it awesome. Chief, thank you for being a phenomenal guest. Thanks for having me. And Thanks finally, you know, phenomenal host. I, brother, I, I, I am the luckiest person in the fire service because I get to talk to the coolest people while the coolest people listen. All that being said, I hope the tone stays silent unless it is burning. Everybody stay safe out there. And honestly, this is the first time ever. I can't just click the button there. And